that I would take a point away from whomever volunteered. Does anybody know somebody named Bashar? Bashar Al-Assad? No, I oh. What'd you get? What'd you get? Connor, you're here. Where's Judson? He was just here. Where'd he, where'd he go? Where? You got the A? What do you point at average? So, so, so we're going to start class. This is just a, I, I just found this, I mean, I found this. I'd seen this some time ago, and yesterday I was in the office. And for some reason, I decided to, I looked it up. So this is in Paraguay, outside of Asuncion, in a city that's essentially a landfill, where people just reclaim the garbage. And this guy decided to empower kids who have nothing by teaching them music, and they didn't have instruments, so they make the instruments out of, you know, junk they find in the landfill. And so you can be in the worst of places in the world and still live, right? So anyway, I just thought that, you know, they actually went to Europe, and this is still going on. This was almost 10 years ago. You know, they still travel through Europe every year playing, playing in symphony halls and all that. So anyway, that's not part of the class, so, but I hope you enjoyed it. it it's called La... Uh, La Philharmonica. They call it the Landfill Philharmonic. They've got several videos out there if you want to see them. If you want to show them to anybody, if you want to find out anything about it. So it has nothing to do with, uh, with that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start class. I just want, want to finish attendance. James, you walked in, right? I saw you. Uh, I, Jose Pablo, you were here. Where did you go? He's downstairs. He's late. No. Ramon. Ramon. Not here. Uh, Bashar, we don't know who you are. Judson, where'd Judson go? He's downstairs with uh, Jose Okay, Pablo. with the late crew. Okay, second shift. All right, minus one point for that. Oh. What? You're, you're, on, you're on time? You're on time? You're late. You're late. You're late. <laughs> okay, listen. I, I just want to start, I want because I, I, I'm not, I don't want to use all, this a lot, because I'm going to have it, and I'm going to turn it off for a while, and then I'm going to, then I, I'm going to uh, turn it back on later. We've got a student, but the computer's got to go down. Alejandro Cardenas is auditing the class, so he might want to come here one day or something, but he's got to shut down his computer, because I don't want him on social media or any of those things that people would go on, so... Um, I'm going to, you know, so we'll go through, let me go through, uh, uh, the risk-reward uh, paradigm in real estate investing is what we're going through today. The textbook reading was Chapter 3 and Supplemental 1 and 1A. Chapter 3 talked about investing in real estate internationally. Supplemental 1 and 1A talked about uh, the, the investment profile. Uh, the re risk reward profile or paradigm in real estate investing and we'll spend a little bit I've got some personal material that I'll use to supplement what the text has hopefully you'll find it interesting I sent a couple of videos out I didn't check to see who looked at them or not but uh, I'm going to cover some of the material I'm not going to redo the video but I'll recover some of the material again uh, some Excel formatting, some Excel tips, and definitely went into some time value money concepts. Uh, from what I saw in the quiz that you, those of you who are in Dr. Forgey's class, I saw you taking, these are the same concepts we're going over. He's teaching you keystrokes in, a, in a, the little gonculator. I'm teaching you in Excel, okay? So hopefully you learn both, you figure out what works best for you. I, I, um, I don't watch movies. I, never, I just want to start on a light side, okay? I never watch movies. I used to watch movies back in my youth, back in the 1980s, and I have horrible memory. People go, oh, do you remember this in a movie? I don't, but there's a scene in a particular movie that I remember very, very well, and it's really, really very applicable to a real estate program, okay? And I had lunch this week with a friend of mine who's, who's an attorney who was a CEO of a, was a, originally a publicly traded pharmaceutical business. They were bought out by a Japanese firm. He's been running a business the last 10 years. Under, under private ownership, and he's just, you know, bailed out. So he's trying to figure out what he's going to do in life. And so we had lunch, and he wanted to know about teaching. And he says, you know, I'm thinking about teaching at a university. What do you think? Uh, so I encouraged him to do it. And why are you laughing, Andrew? 
Of course I encouraged them to do it. But we were talking about uh, the difference that exists in a lot of academic settings between the professors that are just really, you know, purely research, you know, writers, people that don't have that much working experience, people that are practitioners. And I said to him, there was a movie called Back to School. It's a Rodney Dangerfield movie. And some of you guys that are older may have seen this. But there's a scene in the movie. It's an old guy, self-made guy. He goes back to school to spend time with his son. So his son's an undergraduate at a university. And this is his first day of class, OK? It's three minutes. I'll never show a video like this again. But uh, it is relevant to real estate. So a friend of mine sent it to me and, and figured I'd get a kick out of it. I think you all will as well. And so, no. Why is it popping up? Why is it giving me the other one that I just showed you? Oh, that's because I didn't this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. You gotta pay attention. There's a lot of real estate concepts in this here. Okay? Okay, here we go. Exaggeration, right? But sorry. 
bit exaggerated, but you know the issues with zoning, the issues with with permitting, you know the issues with unions, all that stuff is real. So well, the bottom line, I need I need guys, I need computers down, I need eyes. So if you guys are looking at something other than me, I can't be looking, right? I can't be teaching, okay? So um, I I want to start by just going through that. There's something. There's a word called the ratu. Does anybody know what that is? It's still playing. Thank you, Sam. That's why I don't like to use these computers, you know, they just like, they totally mess you up, right? They mess up the flow of the class. Uh, eratum, does, does anybody know what the word eratum is or mean? No, not at all. It doesn't ring a bell. So that's what, what publishers use when there's mistakes in, in written texts. Somebody picks it up after the fact. So I want to do some errata, right? There's a couple of things in the videos that I've done that I think I've... I think I've communicated most of that out, but I want to make sure that we have it. Um, the first video that, so video number four in the first class, when, when I built the same model that we did in class last week, um, I did a really quick shortcut and I, I told you what the monthly rent was for the apartments, right? And then I just multiplied for revenues, I multiplied the monthly rent by the number of units. And what did I forget? The year. 12 months. 12. Okay, so in this country, and it's what I want you to know, and as I told you guys, most of my background is in office and industrial, so when I hear a rent, in my mind, I automatically just multiply it by the square footage, right? In this country, we multiply, or we, we quote, um, industrial, office, and retail rent on a per square foot per year or per annum basis. Multifamily rents are quoted on a monthly basis. And so what you'll hear typically is people talk about how much per month for an apartment. But what's more common, because apartments have different sizes, people will quote a per dollar per square foot per month figure. So you'll hear people in a multifamily industry talking about, well, rents in South Florida today are probably close to $2 a square foot. So that's $2 per square foot per month. Okay, so that's you know the first correction that I have. Uh, that I, uh, that I needed to make. The second one um, is on the second set of videos and it's when I calculated cash on cash return. So cash on cash return is net cash flow, right, divided by the equity that we've got in play. I'll go through these in a second, right? So it's uh, net cash flow divided by the equity that we've deployed in a particular deal. So when I did the video the first time, I took NOI and I took it over equity. The reality is in that particular video, I had modeled some debt below it, and so what I really needed to do was do NOI less debt service, right, to get to what free or net cash flow was. And to the extent that we have recurring CapEx or CapEx that we need to spend, because ultimately what we want here with cash on cash return is, is how, much, how much am I getting in my pocket over how much I've got invested. So it's my yield, it's my true cash yield on a particular investment, okay? So uh, you may also have CapEx. I got a distribution yesterday on one of my investments. Supposedly it has an 11% cash on cash return. I get quarterly distributions. I should be getting 3% every quarter, right, of my invested capital. That's what I think. I got 1.5%. What do you think I did? I called. What's up, Mark? What's up? I mean, I, I mean, we we haven't had any issues with tenants. We have any collection to the issues? Has anybody you know walked out on their lease? No. No. Why aren't you distributing? Oh, we're holding back because we've got to do some capex on 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 the easement that we have. So we've got to do some road work. We've got to do some signage. We're going to have to spend about three four hundred thousand dollars on a project. So all of a sudden. This CapEx has affected my cash on cash return, right? So I'm not getting in my pocket what I thought I was going to get. So yes? What's the uh, NOI minus what minus CapEx? Just I can't read it. That, that service okay. and CapEx. I mean, those would be the common. And what would be typical CapEx things, leasing commissions? Tenant improvements, right? Or any recurring capex that we got to do? 
right? Any questions on that? No? Well, you guys look like, oof. you guys had a rough morning, huh? Yeah. You guys have a rough morning? Check those grades. Did you learn? You're going to learn. Keep, keep at it. Don't worry about it. You know, to err is human, right? To err is human. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about our case study last week, right? How did we think we did in class last week? How did we think we did? I feel like, in all seriousness, the PowerPoints that mattered for the quiz you jumped over. I'm talking I... about the in-class project. I'm not talking oh. about the quiz. Oh, well, I don't understand the question then. The, the it's Excel spreadsheet that we did. Hello, it's Saturday, 1245. We did an in-class project last week. You guys remember? Yeah. I didn't see this as a project more as an activity. That's why. An activity. Okay, the activity. Yeah. How did you guys think you did in the activity? I mean, we went back yeah. and watched a video. And, and that's my point. And that's my point. It wasn't so good. But then you went back and saw the video and redid it. And I can tell you as an instructor, what I got back Monday and Tuesday made me very happy. I'll, I'll get to you, Brian. Made me very happy. Because it taught me, or it showed me, that you can all do the work. Yeah. If, you put, if you put the time in, you put the effort in, you get the output, you get the result. Yes, Brian? I was unaware that I couldn't see the videos on my phone. So for the first video, I saw your face for a whole hour. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't aware that, I was told by peers that if you put it on the desktop, you could shift it away. Yeah, there was, there was a, 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 and when I sent it out, and I, this is a new tool that the university's given us, okay? Um, I did write that you, know, you should toggle to make sure that you make my face really small. Maybe it didn't make sense, but I did put an email. I, I would just suggest, and I know that it, we're different generations, a phone is something you talk with. It's not really a work tool. I know that you can do work applications with it, but, but we, need, we, need to find, we, need to find, we need to find the right tool. We need to find the right tool. Yes, ma'am. We need to find the right tool to work with, right? We saw the other day, those of you who have Macs find that it's very difficult to work in Excel with a Mac. It's not, it's not really the best tool for it. Just like if you were a designer and you're trying to do Quark or PageMaker and you're using a DOS machine, it doesn't really work. So a phone's probably, it may be convenient at times, okay? But I, I didn't want to show my face. I wanted to show the screen is really what I wanted to go over, okay? So uh, when you redid the, the, the uh, um, the spreadsheets, those of you, most of you did. Some of you opted not to do it. I, I would have encouraged all of you to do it. And some of you didn't do it within a time frame, but you still took the time to do it. And I think when you take the time to do it is when you learn. And the reason I wanted to give you the opportunity is because what we built on last week, we'll continue to build on this week. And what we build on this week, we'll build on for the following week, and so on. So if we can't get the base right, it's going to be very difficult to get to the top floor. So that's why I'm encouraging you and that's why I'm taking the time to do the videos and to walk you through all these Excel tools so that you feel comfortable when you're doing them. I don't have the time to do all of that in class with the textbook material that we also have to cover. Okay? When I got the rework, the one things, the things that I would still encourage are a currency sign means something. Just like a comma and a period means something, a currency sign means something. A currency sign to so someone reading a financial report tells you that it's the top line or it tells you that it's a total, okay? So they are only used for top and bottom lines. You don't need to put dollar signs on everything, okay? Got that? I'm going to show you something that I pulled down from the internet in a little bit and you're going to do the, you're going to see that that's how they do it. It's not just one of my pet peeves, that's just the way it is. Um, borders. You're going to see that as well. Some of you still forgot to leave a border on the left side. That's more of a formatting issue or on the top. You did your work right up to the borders or the cell marker. Leave yourself some white space so that it becomes easier to read. Um, pennies. Lose the pennies. Lose the pennies. I mean, unless something's that critical that you need the pennies, lose them. There's no sense working in pennies. And be careful, some of you are working in certain things with like three decimal places and all that. That doesn't even exist. So just get rid of the pennies. It'll make things easier. 
all documents, all files require a heading. Okay? What's the name of the company? Right? What's the report? What are you showing? And what period does it cover? Okay? Leave your file at A1 so that your reader, when he opens up the file, knows what he's looking at. Okay? It's Green Oak or it's D'Souza Properties or whatever, right? It's a statement of cash flow. <laughs> It's, you know, it's a, it's a statement of NOI, it's an income statement, it's a statement of operation. Ramon, I need the computer down, please. And the period that it covers, okay? And the period that it covers, okay? Now, all of a sudden, the reader understands what they're looking at. You're going to see in some of the work that I'll do later that I continue to do it. I continue to do it. Repetition, 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 okay? Um, get used to using, and, and then this is the last one I... Um, there are borders, hard borders. I'll show you that when I open up Excel. You know that, right? You know that there's top, bottom, and there's double. And then there's single lines and double lines. Get used to when you're working with numbers to work with the accounting subscore and double underscore, okay? Um, um, the last two other ones, and these are more, and I'm surprised because those of you who are in Dr. Forgey's class just had that in his quiz. Uh, a lot of you took management fees in that example last week as income. If you're a property and you have management fees, that means you're paying somebody to manage the asset. That's an expense. Okay? So, what the sort of sequence that we should have had would have been, um, you know, potential gross income, right? And from that, we would subtract, what do we subtract from that? Vacancy and what else? Collection losses. Collection or credit losses, okay? And so that was the other thing. Some of you group vacancy and credit losses along with operating expenses. And the reality is, is that's, and, I, and I go through the whole explanation in the video this week about there is no concept of gross margin in real estate, but you, you do have a concept of net revenues, okay? And so to get the net revenues, you need to subtract vacancy loss it's really not an expense, it's just income you're not getting. You know, the reality is, is if you were doing a cash basis report, you would start with this number right here, okay? So, vacancy and credit loss is not an expense like an operating expense is, okay? Uh, and then, uh, so those were, those were the two things, okay? Management fee is an expense, so you would have had operating expenses, and you would have had management fees. The way I wrote the report out, uh, I, I, did it as 40 plus 4, but it would have been okay if you would have understood what I wrote as saying total operating expenses are 40% and you would have said regular operating expenses are 36% and management expenses are 4, hence the total of operating expenses would be 40. Okay? So that's, you know, just from a presentation perspective. Any questions on that? Because we're going to build on this. We're going to keep building on this. and and then start expanding this and blowing this up a little bit. But at a very top level, does that, does that make sense? Yes? Yes? Ramon, yes? Okay. All right. Um, I just want to do a couple of, um, I want to do a couple of, of uh, just current events. I, I, there's, a, there's not a lot, there's a lot going on, but there isn't a lot going on. Um, Where's the 10-year treasury today? 1.8, exactly. Exactly, Isabel? No, last no time idea. I, last time I saw that, it went down four basis points. Your Wall Street Journal stopped, okay? I think you could go on the Wall Street Journal page without having a subscription and still see at the very top where the 10-year treasury is. Yes, Kenny? I saw it at 174. What is 1.8? Yeah, I think it was like 1.796 to be more precise before class. But yes, like 1.8. Yeah, we'll yes, 1.8. Is that good or bad? <laughs> it depends. It depends. And, 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 and does it impact you in real estate? Yes. Why? Uh, money that we borrow for projects. Money that we borrow. So money we borrow, what does that have to do with a 10-year treasury? We would Plus like to have a lower interest rate so we can pay less. Okay, but we always want to have a lower interest rate if we're the borrower, right? Right, we talk. right. I, and if you, did you watch my video on... The two on videos you just, Yes, this yes, past week. Yes. On users and savers, right? Yes. So if, if you're a saver, lower interest rates are not good, are they? No. No. So if you're a user, lower interest rates are good. But what does that have to do with a 10-year treasury? 
Because the treasury rate affects the banks, right? Why is that? I just heard the word. What word did you use? Benchmark. It's a benchmark. What's a benchmark? A comparison. A line. Like a standard? It could be a standard, right? It's something that, and, and I, we, I will repeat this because I mentioned it in the video several times. Why do we benchmark? Why are benchmarks important? So, so we want to have benchmarks that help us compare to where we've been. So what's the trend, for example, with interest rates? Are they going up? Are they going down? Right? We want to compare with where we projected, where we expected we were going to be. We're doing a modeling class, right? So we're doing a model. Somewhere down the line, we want to see how we compare versus what we modeled, right? And what's the last reason why we want to benchmark? We want to com com you know, compare against peers. So in the context of interest rates, right? So um, um, to your point, Chase, if, if, if we have a 10-year, if a risk-free debt instrument yields 1.8% over 10 years, and 10 years is a nice time frame to use in comparison or for the real estate industry because real estate is a long-term asset and a lot of times we model over 10-year periods and we talk about 10-year holds and we talk about reversions at the end of 10 years. So we've got similar like periods, right? So, so there are in fact benchmarks or historical trends that give us an idea of where loans or where debt is in relation to where the risk-free rate is because, because in fact, there is a risk premium associated with anything other than treasuries, right? So we've got things like default risk, right? And we've got a whole bunch of other risks, you know, taxability and convertibility and liquidity and all that that I'm not going to talk about in this class, but there are definitely premiums from risk-free rates that ultimately work us back up to nominal interest rates that people talk about, okay? So we need to know where the trends are. Because if rates are going down, we, we might want to wait before we acquire or well, before we or before we acquire a fixed rate loan, right? You know, uh, if we think rates are going to continue to go down, we might we might gamble with a with a variable rate loan for a while, right? Before we fix it, okay? And we'll talk about a little bit about that, okay? So, uh, uh, I, just some of the stuff from uh, from um, uh, newsletters that I get this week. Uh, uh, there's a study out there that this the study, you know. Uh, actually prepared for NAREED, so you would expect to hear this. It says that REITs deliver better returns of privately owned real estate. We're going to spend a little bit more time on that uh, in a few minutes, okay? So just keep that in mind. So the study says publicly owned real estate has higher returns than, than privately owned. Uh, I, want to, I want to pop this open. I, cause I, I want you guys to get used to doing some of the stuff that I do on my spare time because I mean, it's how we learn, right? So uh, there's, a, there's a thing there that says Prologis. Does anybody know who Prologis is? The largest industrial holder. Well, it's, so it's, Prologis is the largest of the industrial REITs, right? So whether they are, in fact, uh, whether Prologis is the largest owner of, of industrial real estate in the country or not, I don't know. Okay, they're definitely the largest REIT, and they are one of the largest owners. There may be some private people like, like, uh, like, uh, like cow steers, uh, might might actually own more. I'm going to blow this up a little bit, okay? So, uh, who took the accounting class with me or has taken an accounting class with me in the past? So, one of the studies, yes, a long time ago. Uh, you probably don't remember, but one of the case studies that we did, we took supplemental reports from REITs. D does anybody remember that? So, so, publicly traded companies in this country have an obligation to report their financial reports every quarter and then once a year. The quarterly reports are called 10Qs. The annual reports are called 10Ks. And these are all obligations under, under the, the, uh, the, the, the Securities and Exchange Rules, right? Securities Act of 1933 and 34. Public disclosure. REITs go over and above that and every quarter provide an additional, what they call supplemental report. Each industry or asset class reports differently but why, the, why I like looking at these reports is it gives us tremendous visibility into the operations of real estate companies or real estate owners, right? So we get to see things like rents, we get to see things like operating expenses, right? So if I were to ask you, Naisha, today, and you're relatively new in the industry, what industrial rents are across the country, would you know? No. Probably not. Would anybody venture to guess? Who, who knows what industrial rents are in South Florida? We might want to know that, right? We might want to know that. 
I mean, I, I don't know if you need to run a warehouse, if you want to develop, if you want to be a developer, if you want to be a broker, if you want to be an investment sales guy. So I want to proffer a number and say that industrial rents in South Florida, they're going to depend on whether it's Dade, Broward, or Palm Beach County, but they're going to be somewhere between $6 and a very low end, okay, and probably $12 to $13 on a very high end. So I'm talking about Class C product, you know, low ceiling, front loaded, grade, you know, $13 are going to be, uh, these things are going to be 14 foot clear, uh, uh, you know, 200,000 square foot box with uh, rear loading, dock high, 40 or 60 foot column spacing is probably going to be at 12 or $13. And I'm going to quote that as an industrial gross number. Do we know the difference between industrial gross and net? No. Can I ask you again? The 12 to 13, is that per square feet or? Per square foot per year. Per year, okay. Okay? So I'm giving you this number, and I want to validate this in a second, but let's say $12 a square foot. Do we know the difference between industrial gross and that? If we don't know, we need to know. And you should have covered this in some of your classes, some of you are graduating. What is the difference between a gross lease and a net lease? Yes, Chase. Utilities either get passed through or covered by the landlord. Repeat that again, the utilities please. Utilities either get passed through to the tenant or covered by the okay, landlord. Okay, which in which one? Uh, and a net, like a triple net, would be like they pay all of the tenant would pay all of their utilities and okay and, and operating expenses. Right. So so we're talking about the difference between the landlord charging a gross number and directly paying all of the operating expenses of an asset as opposed to a net lease in which the landlord basically gets paid for his ownership interest in the building and the operating expenses are paid directly by the tenant. Now, they may be paid directly by the tenant, typically the landlord will pay and somehow request reimbursement from the tenant, okay? But that's the difference between a gross and a net lease. You use the term triple net, you may not have triple net and we may not have industrial growth. So in office, we don't talk about industrial growth. We talk about full service. So full service lease in, in office would be a lease that includes the lease rate that's quoted includes all of the operating expenses. Now, we may also talk about net of electric. So it would be a full service lease, but the electric would be separately metered and charged to the tenant, right? It may be net of electric and janitorial, where the landlord pays all of the operating expenses except the electric that would be billed directly to the tenant and janitorial, which would be paid by the tenant. Okay, so these are just different concepts that are talked about in different asset classes, but ultimately talk to whether the landlord is ultimately responsible for the operating expenses or the tenant. Now, I want to proffer that there's no real difference, right? Because if operating expenses are three and prevailing market rates are six, what do you think an industrial gross lease is going to be? Nine. Nine, okay? Because no intelligent landlord is going to charge less than nine for a gross lease because he's looking to make or she's looking to make six net after operating expenses are paid. So. In a market, so for example, in the industrial markets in Dade County, rents tend to be quoted industrial gross. In Broward County, they tend to be quoted net. So if you're looking for a warehouse in Broward, somebody may come to you and say, hey, your rent are $6, triple net. In Dade, somebody might say to you, your rents are $9 gross. In theory, there's no difference. The difference that does exist, and we talked about this in class last week, is there are risks associated with operating expenses, right? A hurricane comes, insurance premiums go up. If you're the landlord and you're in an industrial gross environment, you're the one that's running the risk, right? If you're the tenant and you're in a net environment, who's got the risk? The tenant does, okay? So does that make sense? But we need to understand, yes, Chase, we need to understand the difference between gross structures and net structures of, of, of leases. Yes, Chase. So in that instance, like, 
as a tenant, does it ever get to a point where they, or as a landlord, that you would cap like the gross? Like it's gross unless you use an obscene amount of water or an obscene amount of electric or an obscene amount of gas. It's like I, I feel mean, like people could take advantage of you, that. You typically have bumps, and then sometimes you can build in base years. Okay, so you've got a concept of a base year, and then a the tenant would pay increases over the operating expenses of that base year. So there's a lot of different ways to skin this. I, I mean. I, and I'm not a broker, and I'm not an attorney, but there's hundreds of combinations or structures that you can create for leases. I'm just trying to give you the concept of gross versus net. Risk of operating expense going up is borne by the landlord here. It's borne by the tenant here. And ultimately, in a harmonized environment, I mean, they really shouldn't be different. Okay? They really should be different. Okay, so we said for a second that we didn't, we didn't know what industrial, so I gave you this industrial number. Do we know what industrial leases are nationally? Do you know what? We could use a benchmark. Any idea? No idea? Are they higher in South Florida than the rest of the country? Do you think you'd pay more for a warehouse in Miami that's a major, I'm giving you the answer. Yes. That's a major <laughs> port city, okay, that you would pay in Lakeland? Yes. Okay. You know, or that you would pay in Tupelo, Mississippi? Okay? No, I've never been to Tupelo, but I would imagine I don't want to go to Tupelo. Okay, so. Um, okay, let, I'm going to blow this up. So so this supplemental is, is the most recent one from Prologis. And uh, let me blow this up. Okay, I'm going to come to the consolidated income statement. Let me. Uh, so. I'll show you just a couple of things. That show your your professor's not that crazy, really. see how they leave this first row open and how our first column open and and the top one notice that in one they don't have anything I'm not the only crazy one am I it just makes it easier to read now take a look they do use borders as opposed to using the single underscores that I recommend but notice that there's only dollar signs at the very top and at the very bottom Okay, so what I wanted to show you is, is there's tons of information in these reports. This is a, spe a spreadsheet that accompanies their, their supplemental, okay? But if we want to know what rents are, we can come over here. Uh, let me just blow this up. I did this last night because I had nothing else to do on a Friday night, right? Other than, you know, I, 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 get, I get a kick out of this stuff. So uh, I know that USNOI is $434 million for the quarter. I just want to head for kicks just to get a ballpark number. I annualized it. That's roughly $1.7 billion of rents a year. I know they've got 306,000 square feet, okay, dedicated in the U.S., okay, and that's on another uh, um, um, tab. So roughly it's $5.66 a square foot net. net. I'm using the NOI number, net. How much are operating expenses? I went and got their operating expenses from the top from the top P and L, right? Now the problem is this is a worldwide number, and Prologis has I couldn't get just I couldn't get uh, in this report I couldn't get uh, segment information, so I couldn't get geographic breakdown. So this is worldwide total operating expenses were 180 million. I multiplied it by four, 723 million. They've got 460 thousand square feet that they consolidate, so it's roughly a dollar fifty seven. Okay, in operating expense across the world. So you can kind of get to industrial gross rents about seven dollars a square foot across the portfolio. Okay? Now that's gonna diff you know uh, be twelve dollars in Miami, maybe twenty dollars in New York, San Francisco and LA, and then four dollars in Lakeland. Okay? Something like that. Operating expenses for industrial in South Florida are gonna be probably two to three dollars a square foot maybe a little bit low threes max, right? 
Uh, in places like Lakeland and all that, it's going to be about 50, you know, two bucks. What did Rodney Dangerfield say you could run a warehouse for in 1986? He said $1.25 a square foot, right? That's what the movie was before. So there's been a little bit of inflation, okay? But I wanted, I wanted to pull this out. I also want to show you some of the things that are very interesting that I like looking at. And again, this, those of you who've done the case studies in my class would have remembered. Um, I did it with, with Simon. But some of the interesting things here are um, top 25 customers are only 19% of their business. So highly diversified, right? You can all of a sudden take a look at credit risk. Amazon is their largest tenant, has 4% of their, you know, and this is on square footage. They also do it based on NOI, okay? But um, so retailers, retailers is gonna be a big difference between square feet occupied and net income ascribed. Why is that? Does anybody remember? Why would retailers, why would retailers using square footage not be not be a logical measure of, of their exposure in credit. Do, do retailers, do we have a difference in rents that retailers pay? If I go to, give me a mall, I don't go to stores, somebody give me a mall in South Florida. Sawgrass Mills. Aventura. I don't, Sawgrass Mills, that's, isn't that like stuff that's like broken and stuff? <laughs> Aventura, that's where I bought that little thing the other day. So there's what, like a Nordstrom's right there? And what else? Like uh, Macy's or something? Everything. Okay, there's everything. And then there's a, a Bloomingdale or something, right? And then there's a bunch of little things here in between, right? Right? And so, and so, have you ever noticed that to get to these, you got to walk through these? I mean, I don't go to stores that much, but I, I've never been able to get to these without walking through these, right? So what happens in these um, large malls, these big boxes occupy the lion's share of the square footage. But in a place like Aventura, and Aventura is privately owned, so I can't get to that information, but assuming that this was a, a Simon Mall like, like Dadeland or something like that, uh, these guys are probably paying they probably are occupying 40,000 square feet and they're paying how much? Less than $10 a square foot. So depending on how, and they're doing probably 30 year leases with a bunch of extensions, okay? And um, 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 these guys are paying anywhere from five to 10 bucks a square foot. These little guys here have five to 10 year leases and how much are these guys paying? In a mall like this, sixty, seventy dollars a square foot. Okay. So, and when you take a look at a large company like a Simon that has hundreds of malls, all of a sudden you get to companies like the Gap that have multiple locations, and then they start adding up. And so, the exposure that the large malls have to tenants really need to be taken a look at, not on a per square foot basis, because yes, in fact, these anchors. Are, are critical and important, but the inline guys are really the ones that pay the rent, right? This is the shark, and these are the little fish underneath that get all the little dribbles, okay? And you pay a lot to be under the, uh, the umbrella of the shark, okay? Make sense? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, so you know, who are the tenants? Amazon, DHL, what's DHL? Third party logistics okay. firm, right? I have no idea who Geo, Geodis is. Yeah. Uh, they they've got international experience. It may be a third, you know, three PL in Europe. I don't know who that is. XPO Logistics is a third party. Um, Home Depot, FedEx, CUNY and Nagel's another third party logistics firm. You start looking at well, these guys probably don't have a tremendous amount of credit exposure. Right? This is a nice, nice portfolio. Uh, and when you take a look at this, one of the things that they also have to disclose is is uh, you know their income right so you know when leases expire by year and income all right so that way if, I think in, in a couple of sessions we're going to do a little bit of um, due diligence work and we'll take a look at projecting lease expirations and seeing the impact of that on on cash flow right so that when we're modeling and we're looking at buying something we understand what what potential upside or downside there is related to when leases that are in place expire. 
And so do we have an opportunity to mark to market and when a lease expires, earn more revenue? Or are we above market and when a lease expires, we might actually you know, wind up with less cash flow, right? Or we might not be able to, to lease a space, it might go dark, okay? But when you take a look at lease uh, expirations over the next five years, you can see that the average uh, rent per square foot is $5.94. I was pretty darn close in my analysis, okay? So they're saying their net rents are about, are about uh, um, um, $6 a square foot, okay? Um, and operating expenses are, you know, a place like Miami are probably closer to three, so like nine bucks or something like that, okay? Helpful? Is helpful stuff? Okay. Let's, let's move on and do other stuff. No. It's not going to find me. Um, I get all these. Uh, I get all of these. Um, I get all of these uh, offerings of stuff that's for sale. And one of the things you got to read tea leaves. One of the things I have here. One of the tea leaves. One of the newsletters I get says that rail car shipments are down in this country. You say, why do I care? What comes on railroads? Almost everything. Goods. Well, not really. What comes on railroads? Goods. Like, like what? Like raw materials. Okay, what kind of rock? Like what moves in this country? Pro coal, coal, Oil. rock, Pro cars, food, produce, no. Produce goes on trucks or airplanes, right? So, so, so heavy stuff, but it's heavy commodities that are used in things like construction, right? Things that ultimately talk to economic expansion. So in this country, if you look at, nice work for a company on the railroad, that's why I know a little bit, rock, cars, fuel, okay, coal, bauxite, iron, ore, heavy stuff that can't move on roads, right? Because a rail car will pull 140,000 pounds. How much can go on a, on, a, on, a, on a box, on a truck, on the roads? Depending on where it's driving, the bridge. The... No, but there's, no, there's what's, what's a 53-foot container haul? How much does it haul? We should know these things because that's what, what's backing up into our warehouses. But you know how many pallets go in there, right? 40,000 pounds is a good rule of thumb, okay? 40,000 pounds is what a truck can haul. A rail car can haul 140,000 pounds, right? The problem is, is to bring paper, for example, from a mill in the Midwest to South Florida can take you three weeks on a railroad, so you can't put perishables on it, okay? To bring rock from the Lake District, now you know where the Lake District is, to take rock from the Lake District to Jacksonville might take a week, right? I sat next to a guy on a plane one day, every week with his son, he would do a round trip from Miami to Seattle. He would pick up asparagus that was coming from like Peru, and he'd have it in three days in Seattle. He and his, and his son drove nonstop, and then in Seattle they would pick up like blueberries or something and bring them all the way back in three days and they'd rest for a day. And so perishables tend to travel on road. Things of high value tend to have to travel on airplanes, jewelry, computer parts, things like that, okay? But why does it matter that rail car shipments in this country are down 7% from a year ago? When I look at that, those are tea leaves. What does that tell me? Well, I mean, it's telling me there might be a slowdown coming up, okay? Another one, this is a personal one, okay? This is a personal one. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay, when I start seeing a lot of people selling real estate, and I, I'm bombarded now by, by commercial property owners putting assets on a market. What does that tend to lead me to believe? It's a bubble. Yeah, people are saying, hey, maybe it's, it's a good time to get out. Hey, the, this valuation is pretty darn good, and I'm not so, because if, if I think it's going to keep going up in price, I'm not going to put it on the market. Okay, so. Curiously, one of the things that commercial uh, uh, real estate brokers, in, investment sales guys, um, and, it, and that whole business is really consolidated. You've got CBRE, you've got JLL, which is absorbed HFF, uh, you've got Cushman. Those are like, you know, those are like, like the big three legit guys for institutional quality commercial assets in this country. But one of the things these guys are going to tell you is, is, We'll talk about diligence in a couple of weeks because they do a lot of things there. But 
they'll also put the asset on the market with a hypothetical financing package in place. So the one I got the other day was, this was for a retail center here in Florida, and they'd already lined up potential financing. And so they looked at a couple of different things. They looked at, they looked at bank financing. Now why do I bring you these things? Because I can talk about widgets, right? I can talk about the theoretical stuff, but if you don't understand, because now, now the rubber meets the road, now you're going to know what you pay on real debt versus what you pay um, um, for risk-free, right? So these guys kind of said, look, if you look at bank financing, this is what you're going to get. If you go the CMBS route, this is what you're going to get. We'll talk about securitized debt later in the term. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, okay? But these guys are saying for this particular asset, you're going to get 65% LTV. The CMBS, you can only do 65% LTV. That's already talking to lower leverage that we talked about last week. So what I'm reading here is there's appetite for people to provide debt, but there's not appetite for people to provide high lever debt. Okay? That's an input. Term, 7 to 10 years. The CMBS guys are willing to do it for 10 years as well. What is okay? CMBS? I'm sorry, just 10 years. Sorry? So what does so CMBS stand for? Co collateralized Mortgage Backed Security. Okay? We'll Thank talk you. about that. Okay? So this is securitized debt. CMBS is commercial mortgage-backed security as opposed to RMBS, which is residential mortgage-backed security. Okay? I'm sorry, Isabel? Okay. Okay. All right. So this is the term, right? These guys will go 7 to 10. That's, that's a lot more than they used to do. Okay? Banks used to stay less than five years, but now they're going out. They've got to compete. Fixed rate debt. Okay? Banks are willing to do fixed rate. They didn't used to do fixed rate debt. They're doing from 3.7 to 3.9 percent. Imagine. So it's 200 basis point spread from risk free, right? So now we're already understanding, Chase, when we talk about 1.7, now we can already assume, because the CMBS guys are at the same thing, 3.7 to 3.9, okay? So we can already assume that in today's environment, I'm probably going to get debt that's 200 basis points above where the 10-year treasury is, okay? Uh, amortization, these guys will let you do I.O. What's I.O.? I.O.? Interest only. Interest only, okay? These guys give you two options. They'll let you do a 10-year I.O., so you're only paying interest for 10 years. They'll also let you do three-year I.O., and then 30-year amortization thereafter. Now, the term is 10 years, so you're still going to have a bullet payment here. It's not a fully amortizing loan, okay? And then these guys are going to charge 50 bips, okay, as a fee up front. These guys aren't charging any fee. Now, what's the big difference going to be with these two guys? Does anybody know? These guys are going to have what's called call protection. Okay, so these guys are going to look for a lockout period. You're not going to be able to prepay this loan the first two or three years of the term. And then you're going to have to do either what's called yield maintenance or defeasance. Okay, and we'll talk about that when we talk about CMBSs. I'm not going to spend time on it today. Okay, banks tend. The other thing is, is you got to go talk to a special servicer here if you want to do anything with a loan. Here you got a guy, you got there's a banker, you can go talk to the guy. Okay? So anyway. Uh, but now we see, you know, it seems like you can get, so it looks like LTVs, you can't really push. These are cash flowing assets, but you can't you can't push it too much. We got incredible rates, right? So what do you think an asset without even so this is a fictional asset, just like in the video. What do you think somebody would pay cap rate for something like this? What would be the cap rate? I mean, if you can borrow 70% of the money at 4%, right? What kind of cap rate could you push on this? What's cap rate? We haven't done that yet, have we? We've done it in other classes. We went over it in the video. You can look at your notes. What, what did we say it was? NOI? Over. 
You had a question on this, ma'am. What was your question? Miriam, yes, Miriam. You had a question. Let's talk about it now. <laughs> you forgot the question. I didn't forget your question. Your question is, what do we use as the denominator with cap rate? Is that and market so value? In, in the video, so if it's at the time of purchase, you're going to use the purchase price because the purchase price is really the fair market value. But you can do a cap rate calculation at any point in the life of an asset, okay? And you can just substitute the fair market value, okay, at the time. So in year five of owning an asset, you can still calculate what the cap rate is, okay? You just use fair market value, okay? It's your choice. It's your decision. Yeah, well, no. Well, it's your, so, so this, is, this is the little footnote that I had. So if you're a true finance professional, and you are, right, you're never going to use historical cost because there's an opportunity cost. Of, of selling that asset, right? The real value of that asset is what it's worth in the market. So if you bought it for five, but it's worth 10, you're kidding yourself if you think you're yielding whatever over a price you paid five years ago. Because you can turn around and sell that, and that's the yield you should be looking for, the yield on the value that you have outstanding. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah? No? The opportunity cost isn't the money you could make if you reinvested in the property? It, well, so let's use an example. John, so, Miriam asked me a question, and I'm going to just use a scenario. I buy a property for five, okay, and it yields an NOI of one in year one, okay? So what's the cap rate on that? 20%? Is that what the cap rate is? One divided by five is 20%? Yeah. Okay. So let's move forward to year five, and let's assume that the, that asset is now worth 10. You've done all these things to it, now it's worth 10. Okay? Let's, for argument's sake, say that it's still generating one of NOI. Okay? All right? Let's be more prudent and say it's generating two, and that's part of why it's created some value, okay? So my argument is you need to use the fair market value at year five because the upper, so, so you can fool yourself and say two over five, and you can say, hey, um, sorry, you know, I got a cap rate of four. What is, no, the other one, I'm sorry. What did I do here? No, you're right. Okay. But the, rea the reality is, is why? Why? Well, because you can turn around and sell this for 10. Right. And with that 10 in your hand, you're going to look for a return for a yield that's realistic. Right? You don't have five right now. You have 10, a value. So you're just kidding yourself if you're saying, I'm getting a 40% return. You're really not. You're only getting a 20% return. Right? Because right. you could sell this, and if 40 was realistic, you would be generating 4 somewhere else, right? And then you would sell it, if in fact you could get 40%. Does that make sense? Miriam? Yeah? Okay, so you saw where some of these debt things are. I'm only going to do one more. I'm going to skip all these. The only one I want to talk about just for a second is, is WeWork, because I love WeWork. I tried to short SoftBank yesterday, and I couldn't. <laughs> uh, it's not available for shorting on U.S. with U.S. So just some of the interesting things that um, this guy was doing. Uh, so when they were going to go public, Adam Newman, the CEO, called the, the, the head of the, of, of, of the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ to his house in the Hamptons and said, okay, I'm only going to give you the listing if you eliminate ca uh, meat from your cafeterias and plastics. So the guy from the New York, New York Stock Exchange said, dude, like, I'll get rid of plastics, but I can't get rid of meat, you know? I mean, people. Uh, then the guy from um, NASDAQ said, hey, we're going to create a We 50 index for you. 
So they gave him, uh, they gave them the listing. But then there was stuff like, okay, so when, when the, uh, uh, when he started formalizing things, he had trademarked the name WeWork, so he sold it back to the company right prior to the IPO for six million dollars. So he collected six million dollars for the name. Now, he's up there, okay, this, I didn't know anything about this guy. He starts this in 2010 after failed business ventures, including a collapsible high heel and a line of baby clothes. So you start getting an idea what kind of guy this guy was. All right, so the IPO is coming out. The S1 document is, is, is going to be printed. He's a CEO. He's the chairman. He's the largest shareholder. He needs to look at this. He's in the Maldives surfing. What does he do? Does he fly back? No. Oh. He sent somebody on a plane to bring him the document so he can review it while he's surfing. I mean, this stuff is coming out. This is in the Wall Street Journal. Then his wife says, no, it's going to only be printed on recycled paper. And so they, 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 brought, they brought her a sample, and she didn't like it. And eventually the printer quit and said, we can't work with these people. Um, so anyway, there were all kinds of stuff. Oh, so then there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, SoftBank has $9 billion invested in this business. So when they're raising their $100 billion fund, uh, all this trouble is brewing. So they, they have this big reception in California, Mayo Sun comes, they've got all the Saudis and everybody there. And they all of a sudden uninvite the guy from WeWork and it's like, we don't really want to be associated with those guys. There's just been all kinds of stuff. Then uh, JP Morgan got involved. JP Morgan lo loaned a guy a billion dollars. So he bought all these personal toys and he pledged his stock against it. So the end result of this stuff, they've basically taken him out of the business. They've had to pay him a billion dollars so he could repay his loan to JP Morgan in that default. And he's got a 200, $185 million consulting agreement for the next five years. So imagine that. <laughs> wow. Okay. So anyway, I'm not going to go through any more of that stuff. So I do want to. I was going to show you, there's one other, well, we, while we were on that, I, I hate to keep coming back to this, but, because I think it's important to do a couple, um, Alec, what kind of, what kind of work are you doing right now, what kind of industrial, are you building any industrial, or not, what are you building? No, zero, high rise, eight, okay, sorry. okay, so, here's what I want to do, because you can play with numbers and say, you know, what should things be worth, right, so if we know that net rents are, $5.94. I remember I, we did a video on all sorts of, all these calculations, cap rates and things like that. There's a reason why I show you these. If rents are $5.94, right, uh, and there's a couple of different things that we could say, um, if, if, if industrial cap rates are 5, just to use as a number, what do you think that that would put the building cost at? So we can divide that by 0 0.05, right? And so we get to the building costs are about $118 a square foot, right? If an industrial, typical industrial box is $200,000, okay, and we can figure out what their average box is. We can actually come over here. We can actually come over here and see that, and maybe it's smaller now. It used to be bigger, but we can say 3,000. 3,000 assets, right? 432. I'm sorry, it's really, it's really the total because they're doing joint ventures there. Their average building size is 206,000 square feet. So their average building, if their average building, if they're, if they're, if they're a five cap business, they're, they're probably a little bit lower than that, but. We could just say their average building cost $24 million. I mean, there's stuff, there's relationships that we can start looking at. I mean, do we know where construction costs are in Florida for a box? Do, do we have any, do we have anybody else doing construction right now? Uh, no. No, 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 you're back in the, you're in fantasy land. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, oh, 
So yeah, so so probably for a box you're you're well north of a hundred, and then, and that's X land, and so we, we'll do some more relationships because what kind of coverage does industrial give us? We've got architects here. What kind of we've got architects, Juliana? What kind of coverage do we get in industrial? Do we know in South Florida with all the setbacks and parking and all that? Do we know a rule of thumb? No, no, no. So like. If I were to tell you like 45 to 50 percent, and what do I mean by coverage? Look, I think none of this stuff's in a textbook, but this is the kind of stuff that we need to know. What does coverage mean? It's how much of the actual site you can use. Use, right? Coverage. Because if I have a box, right? If I have X acres, right? And I got a 200,000 square foot box in the middle, what do I have to provide, for, for example? Parking. So I got to provide parking. So for industrial, how much parking do I need to provide? What's the ratio that's probably going to be required here in Florida? I got architects. Ten per thousand. No, try door number two. Good try. One per thousand. So for industrial, we're going to be like at one per thousand, right? Okay. So I'm probably going to have to do like 200 parking spaces, right? What else do I got to worry about? Egress and setbacks. So we got, we got, okay, so we, what are setbacks? So they're going to say, yeah, you got to stay away so far from the street and from the neighbors and all that, right? What are some of the other things we got to do? We got to make it pretty, right? Don't we have to do landscaping? Don't we have to put like trees, right? And in South Florida, what else do we have to do? Drainage. Drainage. We got to have some sort of retention area as well, right? So, so to build a 200,000 square foot building, how many acres are 200,000 square feet? Uh, an acre is just like 44,000 square feet. 43,560 okay. square feet. Okay. Well, I don't. Don't you have a gun calculator handy? For what? Four point six, right? So if I'm only covering fifty percent, I need like a nine-acre site, okay, in order to build a two hundred thousand square foot box. Okay, that's a pretty good rule of thumb in Florida. How much does nine acres of industrial land cost in South Florida? Oof. Does it matter where, like in South Florida? <laughs> okay, so in Broward County, you, there's no, you, you can't, you can't even buy. You're going to have to impact some wetland somewhere, and you, you're, you, there's no mitigation credits out there you can buy right now, so you can't even buy it. An acre. Fifty thousand dollars an acre. I'll take 10 of them right now. No, I mean, let's talk in square feet. A million an acre. So how much is that per square foot? I think you're low, but Andrew, yeah, it depends. And it depends what the use of it. So you're maybe, maybe, that's, maybe that's where we're at, OK? So just for argument's sake, let's just say that that's the right number, okay? $23 a land foot, but how do you convert that to building fee? You gotta buy double the land, right? So when you're looking at $118 a square foot, if that's X land, you gotta add another $46 a square foot for land because you gotta buy twice as much land as the building occupies. So today in South Florida, um, Pro Lodges is probably paying close to or just north of $200 a square foot. And probably construction costs are probably, because remember, this is a whole blended, you know, this includes Butler buildings in Indiana and things like that, you know, I mean, it, um, you're probably paying 120 to 130 uh, fully loaded for a, for a box. And you're probably putting in another fifty to sixty dollars a square foot for land. So okay. So anyway, that was just I, you know we don't need to do any more on that. Let's go over. Let's go over the textbook material because I know you guys are dying to go over that. What was chapter three about? International. Investing internationally. Okay, so we've got several people with an international flavor here. So yeah, it was really. Look at that. Great, right? Oh, I know. 
like you, an he's an international so student, so 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 you're an international student, but you come from a place called Denmark, right? Is that where you come from? <laughs> okay. So um, should we go and invest in Denmark? I mean, what does the author say, say about all this stuff? They're socialists. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we've got people in this country who are kind of going that path too, but. Um, Isabel? What? No, do I, no, no, I thought somebody was laughing over there. It wasn't. Good. Okay. So, what does the author talk about internationally? I mean, we read this, right? I mean, how did, first of all, what did the author break international down to? He got to talk generically and said, what did he say? He said 60% of the investment opportunity in the world is outside this country, right, for real estate. Maybe even more, right? And he talked about, uh, he talked about, you know, increasing global trade and, you know, incredible opportunities, you know, as a result of that. Uh, so, well, he, he mentioned Latin America generically. He kind of, he broke the world up into... Like, yeah, I, I'm going to do it differently. I, Because I'm going to put it in, in order of what I think would be, if you're really going to look at it realistically, I think the guy talked about Western Europe and Japan. Okay? That's like, that's like, that's like one sort of thing. Then, let's just get close to us. He talked about Latin America. Okay? And, and in particular, he talked about the BRICS, okay? What are the BRICS? Brazil, Russia, Brazil, Brazil, Russia, India, Russia, India, Russia, China. India yeah. China. and China, okay? And then they talked about some other places in Asia, okay? And if you want to do business in Asia, you probably shouldn't live in Miami. You probably need to live somewhere like, you know, San Francisco or something like that. You need to find places where you've got proximity to the markets in which you're going to serve, okay? So, um, but before we look at all this stuff, we talked about the dangers, and that's a really important thing that we talked about. What are the dangers to international investing? Well, we didn't talk about, not so much inefficient markets, because some of these markets are, are very, some of these markets are very advanced and very transparent. Uh, one second, Kenny. Uh, well, it depends first and foremost where you're at in, uh, in the world. And then the, the big one that repeated itself was political risk. Okay, so um, there, there's, there's political instability in certain places, but there's certain specific risks that they mentioned. Chase? Oh, I was just going to say, um, if there became like a crisis, the illiquidity of the market? So illiquidity. Liquidity is the first issue, right? So all of a sudden, um, what happens, how do you get your money out? Okay. Well, so we can, we can address all these things, and we can have strategies. The guy spends a lot of the time talking about the problems in some of these regions, and then he kind of comes back afterwards and says things like, well, you can mitigate some of this by finding a local partner, you know, who's got, who's got local knowledge, who may have contacts with financial institutions, right? Who may know the government, know the regulatory bodies and all that, but... But illiquidity, okay, talked about illiquidity, we should know these things. In a few minutes, we should know these things. Illiquidity, Currently. scarcity of data, I want to jump to that, scarcity of data. So some markets are very efficient and transparent, some are not. Uh, currency risk is definitely a problem, right? We'll talk a little bit about that, but currency risk is a problem, all right? What did he call, he call something the, uh, when you... Like hedging. Yeah, right. Let me, ju I'll jump to that slide in a second. Yes, Chase. I was just going to say, and you have, like, the legal structure, like, they may not yeah, have... Yeah, so the whole, so there's, there's the whole, there's the whole regulatory environment and legal framework, right? So, uh, you know, what, what legal transparency exists? You talked about Mexico. In, uh, I can't tell you what year, probably about, this must have been 1997, 1998, something like um, I, I took one of my many sabbaticals from work, and a friend of mine was buying a company in Mexico City. And he asked me to go down there and help him do diligence and, you know, whatever. So I went down. This guy, he lived up here in Boca, and 
Hillnet Inc. Manufacturing Company. Large, they were based in California. He lived here for tax purposes, but so they wanted they wanted to expand into Mexico. That you know, NAFTA was relatively new, and what they wanted to do was manufacture in Mexico and bring it to this country. They figured they could have a lower you know cost. That sounds sounds like a good story, right? So he went down there. He found these young kids, and uh, he agreed to invest in their business, and he agreed to loan them money at the same time. So it was kind of like, I'll buy a percentage of the business, and the business needs working capital, so I'll fund that. They say, yeah, but I need security, so we'll get a mortgage. So I tell you, personally, personally, I went to the notary in Mexico City and saw the kids notarize a mortgage. Now, in, in the countries that follow the Napoleonic Code, a notary is not like here that, you know, somebody just puts a stamp. A notary is the keeper of the public faith. Okay? There are no pro property records as we know them in this country. So deeds and mortgages and things like that stay at the notary's office. And the notary is the one that, that keeps that public faith, okay? In, in, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in certain countries that, you know, the notary is an important figure and, and a highly compensated figure because he's a keeper of, the, you know, of, of faith. So, you know, six months later, these kids defaulted on the, on the mortgage. We go down there, we go to the notary, and he says he's got no record of this. This never happened. I was there. I mean, I, nobody told me this. I was there, and it disappeared. And so, you know, the question becomes is, what path then exists to settle your legal claim, right? That's one of the issues that... that that Trump talks about now with China, it's not it's not front and center, but some of the issues talk about what's the legal framework for you know for getting equity and getting treatment, right? And being properly, you know, being able to get, you know, to your so in a lot of these countries there is no sort of legal transparency, right? What's there were elections in Bolivia this week, right? So you guys see what happened? So um, uh, the, 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 the incumbent president who's been president for like 19 years or something looks like he's behind and all of a sudden the electoral council stops, stops counting and 24 hours later they stop counting they're like 40% more advanced and all of a sudden he's got a 10% you know lead what happened during those 24 hours right and now they said the balloting is official and, and the incumbent's the president you know he's the winner so how do you, what do you do? Like how do you, how do you fight that, right? You know, what court do you go to? Who's going to support you, right? How do you collect on your mortgage? So, so the whole legal issue, um, um, uh, you know, is an issue. There are, in fact, some inefficient markets. Andrew talked about efficient and inefficient markets. There are some, when we talk about market efficiency, what do we talk about? We talk about market, those of you taking my, and nobody here took my capital markets class. That was too long ago, right? Okay, market efficiency. When we talk about market efficiency, what do we talk about? Sam, do you know? Does that ring a bell? No? Market efficiency? Market efficiency talks to, you know, um, total and complete and transparent information that's freely and widely available and essentially embedded, right, in prices, right? So, so for example, that would be to say that uh, in the context of, say, in this country of stocks, there couldn't be really any any arbitrage opportunities because at any given point in time the market has all this information priced into the security right now some of these markets not all the information is widely and freely available right so then the question is does that present an opportunity for us so if we go to Brazil Juliana Brian can I go to Brazil and do business should I buy buildings in Brazil yes buy them no okay why but they're inefficient markets the problem is you may not know. See, right there's to get what? Out of this, that's the problem. I'm sorry. They always welcome you to get out. Of, of course, this. they welcome your money. <laughs> come, <laughs> come, <laughs> bring, bring us your money. Do you guys know who Donald Rumsfeld was? Nope. Secretary of State. Secretary of Defense. No, so he was the Secretary of Defense. Oh, Secretary. He he actually had been like chief of staff to like Nixon or I mean these guys were Ford. I mean these guys. You know, Rumsfeld, he's in his 80s now. But when he was the Secretary of, of Defense, he talked about two things. He talked about the unknowns, and he broke the unknowns down into the known unknowns 
and the unknown unknowns, right? So, for example, I know that I don't know how to calculate a derivative, okay? I, I, know, I know I don't know how to do that, okay? What I don't know is what might hit me when I walk out the door, right? There are things that you, you, you're totally blind to, and I think that's the problem in going into a lot of these markets. Because in this country, you say, hey, I'm going to do diligence, okay? But I, 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 I'm going I'm I'm to look at title, uh, I'm going to get a high-paid attorney, but you know what? There's a title company, and you're going to buy title insurance. And if there's a problem, you're going to get your money. But when you go to Brazil, for example, you don't, you don't even know the professional you're dealing with, okay? And I'm not trying to pick on Brazil, okay? I mean, let's say Bolivia, okay? Let's, if you go to Bolivia, you have So there are things that you don't even know might be a problem, right? Now all of a sudden, you know, there's like some Amaya Indian, you know, burial ground underneath what you just bought. And now you got to convert it into a museum. You know, you don't know. You don't know. So there, there are things that are unknowns that we don't know about that make, you know, international investing very, very risky. Uh, I, I will tell you my personal experience. When I was, when I was working in, in my last job, my boss kept getting calls. And, uh, and I, I became the guy to go look at international opportunities. And in particular, we spent a tremendous amount of time in two places. We, meaning me. I went to Puerto Rico, I went to Panama. And, 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 and those were the only two places that my boss would let me go. And you say, why? Well, there's no, there's no currency risk. Because in Puerto Rico, you deal with dollars, and in Panama, you deal with dollars. Okay? So his whole thing was, I'm not going to Mexico. So we were big partners of Prologis. They wanted us to go to Mexico with them, not interested in going to Mexico. Okay? So he said, okay, we'll go. And in particular, both those places, we were taking a look at what uh, were devolved U.S. military bases. So it was an old uh, naval base in Puerto Rico, 10,000 acres, you know, 15,000 foot runway, and it, you know, it looked like it could be an incredible intermodal facility. It's at the entrance of the Caribbean, deep water port, airport, you know, relatively, we thought, low labor costs, we thought, open and transparent government that wanted investment. Uh, I actually even went down there on two or three occasions with a guy named Maurice Ferre, who just recently died, who was a longtime mayor of the city of Miami, uh, who was Puerto Rican, and very well respected, a very well respected family on the island. And I can tell you after four or five trips, I went with the people from Prologis, I went with their general counsel on a couple of trips, and, and their, their comment to me, David Fries, their general counsel said to me, look, we're out. We're not. We, we'll never set trends in a market like this. Like if you guys want to go and do something yourselves and you make it work, then we'll be a partner. But we're not going to be. We're not going to assume that kind of risk. And it became evident after several trips to Rodney Dangerfield's first point: we couldn't get past the political uh, conversations. Okay. <coughs> uh, uh, can't go. See, you can't see the governor. You got to go see the secretary of minutes. You know of. Uh, um, um, industry, uh, he sends you to another sub minister. Then they tell you, you got to go to the town where you want to. Life's too short, you yes. know. And my boss ultimately said, "Look, there's too many things to do in this country. There's too many opportunities here for us to put around it." And then we went and took a look at a military base in Panama, and it was an old Air Force base that had been devolved to the Panamanian government. And uh, again, you know, long airstrip. A lot of housing so we could convert housing. You have potential to do a lot of industrial. You're at the mouth of the Panama Canal. A bunch of trips down there. And then we never, I never had a conversation with the government. Well, I shouldn't say that. We met with the president one day. Um, but we never talked about anything of substance. And all of a sudden in the newspaper, it's like coming across it like we we're trying to bribe people. And I showed that to my boss and he said, don't go down, don't, don't go down there again. It was like, you know, it was almost like the, the journalists had an, an expectation that whoever would win these bids, you know, would, would get it by bribing somebody. And so, you know, we just like, we just, life's too short, you know? Life's too short. So just like the professor said, you may work with bribes and all that stuff, but we're not going to do that in this class, okay? So we're not going to do that. Uh, uh, some of the things that the author talked about, Western Europe, 
excess of real estate capital, excess of capital. In fact, I talked to you guys last week about um, a guy that we had speak here um, that's teaching at, at University of Central Florida now. Um, he's a partner at a firm called GLL Capital Partners. They invest in Class A office buildings in 24-hour city. So, you know, in this country, it's New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Chicago. That's it. That's it. Very high class, very high end. Um, they're buying at cap rates three and a half to four. So, you know, which talks to the next point, they have very, very low return expectations for their capital. So, um, I, I had a call the other day with a son of a friend of mine. That they're, they're developers, they're trying to come to America. Um, they're doing deals. They've got a deal in Paris right now. They've got a deal. They've just finished a, a big retail redevelopment they've done in Geneva. Um, and they're doing stuff at three and a half cap rates. Now, interest rates are lower there, right? So you can buy Italian sovereign debt at like 65 basis points. Okay? So I, I guess that means that there's less risk in that than there is in the States. I, you know, I don't, I don't believe that. But so, so there's an excess of capital and there's very low risk expectations, okay? Um, and, and what the guy talks about, and I think it's true, he says that the um, returns on equity in most major markets throughout Western Europe are relatively homogenous. So you're going to see that those three, three and a half cap rates are going to be the same in Paris, London, you know, Madrid, um, um, you know, Barcelona, Milan, Rome, you know, Vienna, Munich. Uh, and so, um, you know, the question becomes, you know, where do you add value there? How do you displace yourself without the local knowledge and compete with a lot of capital that looks for low returns? It's, it's really very difficult. In fact, um, the son of this friend of mine called because they're looking at a hotel site in D.C. They're looking to actually come the other way and say, we're not so happy with what we're doing here return-wise. You know, maybe we can uh, uh, take a look at, uh, at, at, here, at here in the States. And we've got uh, one of the largest uh, office and retail owners in this country today is, is a guy is a guy uh, uh, named Amancio Ortega, who's the largest shareholder of Inditex of SAC. You know, he, he owns the Epic, he owns the Bacardi um, uh, headquarters in Coral Gables. I mean, the guy's got you know billions of dollars invested in U.S. real estate. Why? Because the return profile here is more attractive than what you can get back home. Um, so uh, you know the. A couple of the buildings on, on the corner on, on Brickell, uh, uh, 1451. Uh, that office building was built by Alan Ojeda. That's all Spanish money. The apartment building behind that, the Broadway, Alan Ojeda. So this is all money that's come from Europe. Uh, the, the, the original developer and then the second owner of what is the uh, uh, Marriott, uh, I forget what that building's called now like 1101 or 1100, not 1100, but it's like 1101 Brickle, Spanish money as well. So a, a tremendous amount of European capital. So it's, it's more like capital coming this way than capital going that way, okay? But you do have legal transparency there. You don't have the you know, sort of problems in the currency. We'll talk about hedging in a second, okay? Japan, he talks about the same thing. Very difficult market to penetrate culturally. Uh, an economy has been in the doldrums for the better part of 40 years, okay? Very difficult and expensive to set up, and very, very low return expectation. So, again, nice legal structure, but... I'm sorry, yes, Isabel? I was just thinking social dependency. I didn't hear you. Okay, forget it. I forget. Okay. So, let's go to the BRICS. Let's go to Brazil. On a side note, yes. I, I think, interestingly, when I was reading this chapter, that I got the assumption that the textbook was kind of implying that there's an assumption that real estate outside of the U.S. is not worth the attention. Yeah. When it talks about like how it wants to emphasize the countries, and how I, it says like some people are not down and stuff like that. I thought it was interesting. I didn't know that. Look, I, I think, Sam, I, I think, I'm going, I'm going to tell you, you know, the experience that I had with my boss. It, it's a big, you know, we saw the slide the other day and we saw that there is limited real estate here. We talked about developable land only being 6% of the surface area of the country. But with that in place, you know, the reality is there's still a lot of, to do here in this country right. before you have to assume, you know, the illiquidity, the currency risk, the, you know, the lack of transparency in legal markets, the lack of local knowledge. 
So, yeah, I, I, I think ultimately he does give you some tips. You know, he talks about borrowing locally. He talks about cur hedging currency. And I'll talk about that when I get to the slide. It's a, oh, wait, did you guys find the slides helpful when I sent them? I sent slides to some of you. After the quiz, yeah. Yeah, after, yeah. Because yeah, no, if I give you slides now, then you don't take notes. And we know that taking notes, writing your own notes is a much more effective way of learning than just looking at somebody else's notes. You know, so. what illiquidity is. It, illiquidity is, is it really ultimately talks to not being able to monetize something very quickly. Okay, so if all of a sudden you own real estate in Argentina to say something, and, and all of a sudden there's an election in, in June of this year, a primary, and, and a presumed anti-business candidate wins the primary and looks like they're going to win the general election, and all of a sudden bonds go to zero, property values go to the, you know, to, and then nobody wants to buy. Okay, so, or, or the price at which they're willing to buy is not, is not an appropriate price, okay? Uh, so in Brazil, um, they say it's less foreign due to its proximity. Less foreign, L less foreign is what the, the book says. I, I, I don't know if it's less foreign or more foreign. Uh, I, I, I've been working for 37 years and Brazil's always been a country of the future. And it's always had these cycles. And, and it, it always, like just like when you think that it's really there, boom, it all of a sudden drops. Um, I can tell you, it says it's emerging from its worst recession in history. I don't know if it's the worst. And rolling political scandals, I don't know if it's really emerging from those yet. Uh, tight credit markets. I know in real estate, I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, you've got to borrow a U.S. dollar. I think if you're going to get real estate financing, you've got to, you've got to borrow in dollars. And now, now you're exposed to currency because you're, you're collecting rents in the highs and you've got to pay back in dollars. And if the currencies go the wrong way, that's not going to be good for you. Uh, it does say that it's not transparent and corrupt. So I, I don't want to make any value judgments on that, but my experiences in Brazil would support something like that, okay? So, uh, so it is risky. Uh, the old Soviet empire, he talks about Russia, I'll add Ukraine, because in Ukraine is, is you know, it's a, uh, one of my sisters lived in, in Kiev for four years. They got back three years ago. My brother-in-law is a diplomat, and his biggest complaint there was that even all these years later, even after two sort of revolutions, the Orange Revolution, and uh, you know, the country's still rife with, with corruption, just like just like the Soviet Union. You know, cronyism. So there's you know there's the oligarchs, and those are the guys that control everything. And and it, it seems like every it's like what were those those babushka dolls or whatever that like you think you you got to the bottom and you could just peel back and then now that was another layer of corruption or. Or, or obstacle that you got to come to, okay? Uh, they talk about Poland and the Czech Republic. I can tell you, I've got, I've got friends. So I've got one friend who, who has and continues to have a, a very successful multifamily development business in Poland. And uh, when I was in Spain last month, he said it's, it's, it's kicking ass. It's 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 like it's the only thing he's you know he went through a very bad time in Spain and had to sell everything in Spain. Uh, but he's kept his business in Poland and it's going well and. Uh, it's a small market, uh, and and then these other friends, the ones that are looking at the hotel side, have actually done a couple of developments in Prague that turned out very well for them. But again, these are all relatively small markets, and you know, I don't I don't know what the future holds. You know, how much more growth? There was a tremendous influx of capital in countries like the Czech Republic after the yeah, Iron Curtain and after you know their association with the European uh, Union. But you know, I don't know how many million. Five, six million people there. How big a market is it? How you know how many opportunities are there, right? So, um, India. I'll, I'm just going to read three sentences here. Fraught with corruption and lack of transparency, local jurisdictions that have a reputation as corrupt and labyrinth legal system. Do I need to say any more? So, uh, but if you want to outsource work there, they could probably do it at a low cost. <laughs> um, China. They talk oversupply resulting in ghost cities. I don't know if you've seen. I mean, they're, yeah, they're weird. Right? It's interesting. It, it's interesting how the one day, and I'm not a banking system guy. One day there's going to be a problem related to all the property loans that are on the 
big Chinese banks, books. And there's some cities that, I mean, they're frightening. They're fully built and there's nobody living in them. Well, sometimes there's like a handful of people living in them, which is even more frightening the fact that, you know, you could be one person in like an entire condominium that is empty and just how weird that must be. Maybe the neighbor doesn't cause the noise though, you know, so yeah. <laughs> anyway, say so they also talk here about non-transparent and, and uh, considerable corruption. Sam, I'm validating everything. Doesn't sound like the author likes this stuff, right? Uh, Latin America, region prone to inflation and military coup. Does anybody disagree? Yeah. Nobody disagrees. Uh, absence of long-term debt markets, okay, and that's a fact. I mean, even, you know, it's very common. We, we saw a little bit of this after the, uh, the 2008 crisis in this country. The few developments that were done were financed by buyer financing. So based on, uh, and this is very common, this is actually very common in the Middle East as well. Uh, you set up benchmarks, and so uh, you, you'll, give a, you'll give a developer a 10% deposit, right? So, I mean, what might be common here, you might give developers on residential projects 20 to 30% financing, or uh, a deposit up front. In the state of Florida, uh, a less, uh, a less, well, I should say that, uh, you've got to escrow the first 10%, and then you can get the seller, the buyer, to waive any additional escrowing, okay? But that's what you typically see, and, and that kind of provides a capital stack for the, so if, if a guy's doing a tower, if you want to take a look at the capital stack, if he's gonna spend 100, he's likely going to have about 10 of equity, right? He's gonna have maybe as much as 20 of deposits from, from buyers, right? Which are liabilities at the time, right? And then, um, he's probably going to get bank financing of about 70 percent. Um, if he can only get 10 percent here, or let's say that he only has 5 percent equity, uh, there might be some MES financing. We saw a tremendous amount of that. Which some is what? MES. Mezzanine. mezzanine. I, I don't know what that means, though. Okay. Like, I, I know, know what a mezzanine is in, like, a sense of, like, a location and, like, okay, a so what's a mezzanine Same in the case of a location? High interest debt equity. Wise. Okay, but they're, they're, yeah, it's not just high interest. I, I, I wish this class let me spend more time on that, but what's a mezzanine? So if there's a warehouse and you got a mezzanine. There's a lower level. Well, a it's, level. A, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intermediate level. level. Yeah. Okay? So mezzanine debt is, is debt. It's debt. It sits between traditional debt and equity. Okay? And typically, and typically it is subordinated. What does subordinated mean? Second position. It's it's second to first. any secured debt or first debt, okay? So it's going to be subordinated to this guy, okay? It's going to have a higher interest rate, right? And typically the security that's provided for that, and I don't have time to draw this out, is the equity guy is going to pledge his interest, his equity interests in the venture to you as a guarantee. So you don't have... As a MES lender, you don't have security in the asset that's being built, but you do have security and then you have access to the equity interests in the venture. Okay, and that was very common here with all the condominiums that were built here in the 2000s, okay? So anyway, so what's typical in Latin America is you'll give them the 10 or 20%, and then when they reach a certain level in the building, you've got to give them another 10%, and when they reach another certain level, you give them another 10%, and so on. And so people are financing as the building is going up because there's no traditional bank financing for some of this stuff. They're starting to do it in it, Miami now. It, well, this was done after 2008. A couple of the condos that went up in Brickell went up this way. Uh, in the Middle East, do you guys remember the pictures in Abu Dhabi and Dubai of like just these stop projects? I was in Dubai in 2009 and there were hundreds of buildings which is just ghost buildings, undone, some still had cranes, some didn't. What was happening is, this is how they were financing, through seller deposits, uh, buyer deposits. The world you know, economy just came grinding to a halt. People stopped paying. Developers didn't have the money to keep going. So they just stopped, sent all the work crews home. So, um, so you know, Latin America is the same thing, right? Non-transparent and corruption concerns. Sad, but true.
Asia, you know, same thing. Talk about Korea, the Chaebol. Does anybody know what the Chaebol is? Those are, so there's there's a series, Samsung, like Kia, family controlled, they may be publicly traded, but family controlled, uh, I forget what they're called in Japan. Um, there's a name for the ones in Japan, but they're like large industrial concerns that basically control entire chunks of the economy, right? So Samsung will do televisions, radios, you know, cars, you know, heaters, you know, have banks, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so it's just saying Korea's a big market, but very difficult to penetrate. What you're going to get is what these guys don't want. So basically, um, you know, summary, capital is ample. Returns are low. Where do you add value? Where do you fit in? So yes, it is a large world, but where do you fit in, right? Uh, that's the question you need to ask before you go overseas, okay? People in other countries are not dumb. They're not any less astute or educated than you are, okay? So they are going to have the same profit motivation and same intelligence that you have. So you really just need to ask yourself the question, what value do I add when I go overseas, okay? Um, uh, so some of the things this guy talks about to hedge, that, well, to hedge, to mitigate these, is he talks about joining forces with a local developer. We talked about that. Um, joining forces with local developers is a good tip or a good idea anytime you go outside a market that you don't know. I mean, you could go to Orlando and maybe benefit from having a local developer, okay? Because getting permits, right, understanding what water issues are there, Right, knowing local lenders, community lenders there, you know, might be an obstacle. And you might overcome all of these things, but those all will bring time, right? And time brings what? Risk. Uncertainty, which brings risk, right? Which is risk, okay? So, uh, what is hedging? Hedging is, uh, what's the... Isn't it just a method, or at least terminology, like a method yes. of protection? So, 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 yeah, but, but in particular, hedging, I'm trying to think of the exact financial, a hedge is when you take a position, okay, when you take a financial position that is opposite your position, all right, to mitigate risk, okay? So, you could, for example, I'm, I'm not going to get into this, you could buy a stock, right and buy a put option to have a floor under which to protect your price as an example okay that's a hedge okay when you do a currency hedge right you put a hundred you convert a hundred dollars today into ten thousand pesos just to say something okay you essentially can buy insurance right you can enter with someone else right into a currency hedge right or a currency swap in which you could try to fix this ratio, this relationship, or some similar relationship, but there's always going to be a cost or a risk associated with that. Okay? So you can buy some sort of forward contract that can preserve this relationship or safeguard it or mitigate the potential loss, right, that you have. Okay? So I don't want to spend a lot of time, I think that's really for finance class, but it's taking a position that will mitigate any risk that you have on degradation in value in the local currency, okay? So listen, I, uh, Heinz, does anybody know who Heinz is? Like the ketchup? Like the ketchup company? <laughs> Guess that's a no. <laughs> Heinz, oh, yeah. as opposed to, <laughs> okay, okay, this is ketchup. Heinz is probably the largest developer in this country. Oh, we should know that, okay? So we need to know about ketchup, but we're going to need to about Heinz a little bit more. Heinz, I think they're out of Houston, but it's, 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 it's an international development business, okay? Heinz went into Brazil. I think they've been in Brazil a couple of times. And I'm trying to think, they went into Brazil around 2000, 1999, 2000. Things were going really well. They put $800 million worth of equity into the country. So they went out there and, and they have, I forget, they went from like four to like one or something like that. I mean, I did like, they had this huge devaluation. 
and they lost like four. And then they decided they, they needed to get out. They lost like four hundred million dollars. The largest developer. They're really smart, and and so they um, they didn't hedge. They didn't hedge. They just flat out put the money. And so you know you can make a lot of money in some of these markets, but you could lose a tremendous amount of money. So I I'm going to be with the author, and I would say. Uh, go west, young man, or you know whatever that saying is. There's plenty of opportunity in this country uh, where you know you know the terrain and you know the business practices and you know the way people work. And uh, I think there's a you know there's a, there's there's a risk to going internationally. The last thing that the author says that you could do is is just reinvest your profits locally, and that way you you you, you mitigate any any risk, right? Because you're always now you've just got ten thousand of whatever, you know, base uh, or whatever. Um, you know, the problem is at some point you got to call your money home. So you just can't keep reinvesting in a country. At some point, you know, you you know you, you want the money back. So so that that helps you for a little bit, but that doesn't help you forever. So anyway, that's the component related to international investing. That is not the component related to. Um, the risk and return um, paradigm in in real estate, and I, I I'm going to switch to that. And I'm going to go over some slides. Uh, but do we have any questions? Yes, Jacqueline. Well, he also there was one part where he wasn't as negative, where he was saying that large enough um, uh, entities that have their machine running already can go into yeah. you know where they're doing it over and over, and they bring everything they need, sort of thing. So I, I mean, what I would tell you is, is there, I mean, there, there are definitely significant examples of U.S. businesses that have successfully expanded overseas. Um, let's talk a little bit what's closer to real estate, okay? Um, let's talk about asset management businesses for, for a second. So let's talk about like uh, a private equity fund like Prudential. So Prudential will invest, will raise money from U.S. institutional investors and invest it in this country. Well, they've set up a, an office in London that covers all of Europe. And what they tend to do is source local funds to invest locally. So, so they take their know-how and they apply it elsewhere, but they've got a totally different currency equation, okay? And now they're catering to, to return profiles that are equivalent to what the local natives have, okay? So that's one way. JP Morgan would do the same, for example, right? Uh, so those are, you know, some. Blackstone would, would, would do the same thing. So any of these sort of private equity uh, um, guys who do that. Uh, if, if you look, if you look at, uh, at, at, at U.S. manufacturing businesses, I think there was a tremendous amount of it, um, um, sort of you know, going to foreign lands a long, long time ago. So the Heinz of the world went a long time ago. I, I don't think that you see a tremendous, you see a lot of sourcing from local plants. So there's a lot of buying of finished goods, there's technology transfer, so you design it here, and you have somebody else do it for you, and you're just buying it rather than going in country and building a plant and 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 sinking funds because of all these other issues that we have, right? So what what's happening? So there's a lot of pressure on China right now. There's tariffs. What are U.S. manufacturers doing? Going to Vietnam. They're going to Vietnam and stuff. So. So the model that companies are following now is a lot more flexible in that sense. There's a little bit less, so the people are going internationally, but it's a different so, so rather than investing, you know, hard dollars in local ground, let's say in real estate, uh, they're, they're more of, of trading relationships. So uh, I would say real estate's a hard challenge internationally for U.S. funds. You can take your brain trust though. Can I just erase this so you guys don't keep looking at it and feeling bad? <laughs> okay, a any other questions or comments? No? Okay, so. Uh, what country would you want to invest in? What, what country would I invest in? Real estate. In real estate. Yeah. Um, so like, I want to move to Spain, but like I'm going to rent. <laughs> I mean, you know, renting. So. Now, I'm, we're talking about residential, right? But the reality is, um, I, I, I have a former student who's argued vehemently with me that um, over the last 20 years, uh, buying real estate, residential real estate, has been a worse investment than renting. 
And, 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 and that is probably true as long as you're an astute investor. Okay? I have, I have, I have a, I mentioned the other day, I've got a house and then my office. Uh, my office, which is a house I bought in 1994. And so, you know, I thought, wow. You know, I, I paid very little for it. It's worth a ton now, right? I said, just for, you know, just for what giggles, let's do an IRR analysis. It was like 6%. And, 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 does, and that, that's not counting all the carrying costs every year. So the reality is, is if you're an astute investor, we're going to take a look in some slides now. Where's, what's, how's the S&P performed over the last 20 years? And how has real estate performed? And so, you know, if, if you're an astute investor, you might actually do better in other investments other than real estate. I happen to think real estate is part of a portfolio, okay? So I'm not totally, but I'm not convinced. There's a whole bunch of other issues related to investing in other countries. Um, tax is a, is a huge problem. So what happens with residency? What happens with unitary tax? Do you get taxed on wealth at a particular level? Are there tax treaties? You know, it's tricky. It's tricky, okay? So I, it, it's not that you can't do it, but it's tricky, okay? Um, so. We don't want to look at this anymore, right? We want to look at something else. You guys want to look at the answers for the quiz that you're going to have in a little bit? Yes. Yeah, but I'm not going to show you that. Come on. <laughs> really? Do you want to look at, do you want to take a look at the slides I just went over? No, of course not. Why would you want to see that? I just went over that. So, um, but what I, what I do want to jump to is, um, I'll send those to you, okay? I'll talk about the return characteristics of commercial real estate, okay? So the first thing I want to talk about is the source of information. Uh, um, and the book talked about this, NACREF. What's NACREF? NACREF? The National Council of Real Estate. Investment fiduciaries. <laughs> okay, what the hell is that? And what the heck's a widget, right? What's NACREF? So, so NACREF is essentially the lobby for all institutional real estate owners in this country, okay? So when you look at what MetLife, Peru, Northwestern, okay, ING, all the institutional investors have all come together and have a guild. And they come together and they share information. So it's called the National Council of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries. They create certain benchmarks. And those benchmarks help individual investors understand how they're doing in comparison to everybody else, okay? So because NACREF exists, so they've got, there's a NACREF property index. This is um, three-year-old data, but that's where the author is, you're gonna see. I'm not that far off from the author, okay? But it's about half a billion dollars, and it's about 8,000 properties that they canvas every quarter. And based on that, they come out with benchmark information, okay? Uh, uh, they do so geographically. They do it by asset class, and they do it by investing style. So they look at core, value, and opportunity funds, returns. They look at east, west, midwest, and south. So they look at returns that way, and then they look at returns as industrial, multifamily, retail, office, hospitality, timberland, and farmland. Okay? Now, I used to get all that, but they don't... I used to get some of that. I can't get it anymore. So it costs like 10,000 bucks a year. Like if you're full-time faculty in a university says you're doing research, they'll let you have the info. But I'm neither full-time faculty nor am I doing research. So I can't get it. So I, I stopped. I, my, my information goes to 2016, but that's where the author goes. So what I have is as good as what the author has, OK? Now, there's two other organizations you should know. NAREIT. What is NAREIT? National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts. Okay, and that is a lobby for the REIT industry. Okay? They also provide benchmark information, which is widely and freely available to all of you. And there's no NAREIT here. It's going to be later on in the presentation. I just, and there's, there's one other one out there you may hear. You won't hear it in the textbook. It's called NAREIM. Okay? NAREIM. And NAREEM is similar to NAREEF, okay? National Association of Real Estate Investment Managers, okay? So guys that are in NAREEF tend to be more portfolio managers, 
big executives, a lot of the guys that are on the ground as asset managers belong to Nareem. Okay, but Nareem and Nate Creek, they're different organizations, but they share a lot of the same body. Nate Creek is private equity real estate. They read is public equity. So when we take a look at the quadrant that we talked about the other day, right? So if we say assets equal liabilities and equity, right? When we break this side into a quadrant and we talk about public and private, right? There's private debt, private equity, public debt, and public equity, okay? Private equity is may grief. Public equity is may read. Okay? So we want to take a look at return profiles. We want to take a look at the risk return or the risk reward paradigm. Okay? We look at benchmark data from Nate, Nate Creef or Nate Creef, Nate Reed or Nate Creef, depending on whether we want to know about privately held or publicly traded uh, equity. Okay? Any questions on that? No? We can move on to the next slide. Okay. So um, all right, this is me, this is the textbook, okay? This is 1978 to 2016, this is 1978 to 2016. It looks like they're pretty similar, right? Yeah. Okay, and in fact, and in fact, when you take a look at, I've got a mean return for privately owned real estate during that time frame of 9.1% with a standard deviation of 7.4. Now we talked about this, I'll repeat it now if you want to, okay? Linneman, with all his resources, comes up with 9.07, which sounds like 9.1. If I would've taken it to another level, it'd probably be the same. And he's got 7.41 <coughs> as standard deviation. So it sounds like either we're both wrong or we both got the same information, okay? so. Uh, what's important here is, is, so these are annual returns. I'm going to talk about something called annual returns and geo mean next week so you understand when we're dealing with returns how we can work with them, right? So, but what we're basically saying is, is that during that time frame, the expected return, right, the expected return is 9.1%, okay? And the standard deviation, right, the standard deviation is 7.4%, right? And you know, depending on how far out you go, right? If you go out, what, three standard deviations, it's like 99% of all expected occurrences, right? So, you know what, like 67% of the time, you should be plus or minus 7.4%, right? And 95% of the time, you should be plus or minus another 7.4, right? Okay, and um, you know, you should never see anything beyond that third standard deviation because those are black swan events that never happened, right, except in 2008. So there's no black swans, but I guess there really are. But does that make sense? So we understand it now. How does that compare to other investment vehicles? Should we invest in real estate? That's a question you ask. How does that compare to publicly owned real estate? Should I buy REITs or should I stay with private equity funds? The problem is, is there's a liquidity issue with these, right? Because who gets into these funds? You know, who does Prudential and MetLife manage funds for? High net worth. Even more, institutions, pension funds, endowments, and then wealthy and, you know, high net worth individuals, right? These are all for qualified investors. And so the reality is, is you probably can't even get into a, you can't, first of all, none of us can get into a Blackstone fund, ever, ever. Ever, you're working in this stuff. You can, can't forget. You, you can't get into a prudential fund, you know, and that's like run of the mill. Okay, you might get into my fund. I'm taking <laughs> subscriptions at the door. Okay, and your grades going to no, I'm just kidding. No, uh, you're really not. We're, just as individuals, we're just not going to get there. Okay, so uh, uh, and 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 the offset to that is all these. All these investors have a very long horizon, and so liquidity is not an issue for them, right? They're not going to have a call on money that they need. Oh, my son called from college. He's out of money again. You know, how, how do you tap into this? You can't, right? Because these funds tend to have lives of 10 years plus. They'll probably have one or two additional years, all right? So when you get into these funds, 
It's for the long road. It's for the long term. Okay. So, you know, and how does this compare to other assets? How does it compare to equities? How does it compare to bonds? How does it compare to art, collectibles, commodities, derivatives? Okay. We'll talk about that next week. I, I don't. I, I'm not going to talk about that this week. We'll talk about that next week. If you want, if you don't want to talk about it, we won't. Now I'm going to jump through these kind of quickly because there's really there's really nothing. I think you could focus on different asset classes have different risk reward profiles. Okay. Now this is retail through 2016. If you looked at it today, you might actually have a lower return and higher volatility. Because in particular, retail holdings have been really hit, hit the last two or three years. People are starting to wake up and say, hey, there's something going on with, with the retail sector. We're not sure what the returns are going to look like, okay? So valuations have taken up. But it's a very low standard deviation, more so than the collective group, right? Uh, I think some of the things that you'll find that are interesting is apartments are not that high, but again, relatively low deviation. Industrial, okay. Office definitely lower returns and more and more deviation. So you can already see office is a riskier asset. And I'm going to jump. The next one's hospitality. Hospitality should be more so, and you can definitely see that, okay. You definitely see that when you get into the public. Publicly traded hotels are like stay away from those. Just like mortgage REITs, be careful with that stuff. A lot of volatility. Now, it's a couple interesting ones we never look at here. Timberland, look at the return profile on that, 11%. Now, you know what's interesting about timber? I didn't know anything. You know, timber's real estate. Did you know that? So didn't we're not talking, I think what she said I heard her is like, we're not talking about like the company Timberland, we're talking about like the actual land where timbers oh, are. God. <laughs> yes, I, because what are you, like, is it really like, like, like that, or is it just like timber, like space land? Like, is it like timberland? Land with trees on it. It's yeah, but that's like a normal trees. terminology. It's, it's an incredible. Like I've never it's seen an incredible. It. I mean, we saw the other day timberlands in this country, 20% of the surface area. Gotcha. All the building products in this country, all the paper products, come from timber. So we probably never think about this stuff, right? There's a lot of stuff we don't think about. We don't know where, where the babies come from, from the stork. No, I mean, where do all these things come from? They come from timber. So there's a lot of timber in Florida. When I showed you the map of Florida the other day, almost the entire who went to FS who here? Anybody go to FS who here? FS Nobody went to FS who? Okay. That whole panhandle is all Timberland. Okay? Now, primarily for building products and paper. A lot of newsprint up there. Okay. But the interesting thing is, take a look. They almost have no negative returns. Almost all of their years are positive. Okay? You know what the interesting thing is with timber? You don't have to harvest it. Right? So all of a sudden, prices go down. What do you do? Let it keep growing. And you yield more. I mean, there's a time value of money issue, right? But Timberland is a very, it's a very interesting asset class for high net worth individuals and for endowments. Okay? It's one of the traditional alternative investments. And it is in fact land with trees on it, not but trees. Like, so like what what would constitute as a timber like anything with trees on it? Because like so how example, dense does it have to be? So so for example, take a look at take a look at um, there's a REIT called Rayonier. Mm -hmm. That's all Timberland. Yep. Take a look at a REIT called Same Cross Joe. Creek Timber. That's Timberland, okay? So, uh, and then there's a lot of privately, because of the long horizon, a time frame, most Timberland is owned by private equity. There's very little mm -hmm. public equity. That's why you, don't, you wouldn't know about it, okay? I'm going to surprise you with the next one. The best returning of all, farmland. Look at the returns on this. And look at the standard deviation. And not one negative year over the last 20 years. And look at some of these years. Annual, re these are annual returns. Annual return. Holding period returns. HPR. Holding period return. So that's return from one year to another. So that's price appreciation and distributions. So why would it be so high? I mean, you think crops give us that much money? Is that taken into, uh, into account? So it could. So what, what farmland is in this country and in, in the context of Naicreef is going to be, and really there's, there's, a, there are a couple of, of, there's a couple of farmland REITs out there. 
Uh, it's going to be one of two things. It's going to be people that own land that they lease to farmers, and, and it could be for grazing. People have got livestock. It could be for what's called row crops, right? Or it could be orchards. Look at all the things you learn when you teach real estate. I didn't know any of this stuff, right? What are row crops? Like, all city folk here. Yeah. The, 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 what, like you mean plowing, like, 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 like grapes for wine? No, like, yeah, so, no, like lettuce, yeah. tomatoes, right? You know, oh. potatoes, okay? Stuff that you cultivate, right? And you throw out. Orchards are things like oranges, oranges, apples, pears, <laughs> lime, okay? And so it could be land that is leased for that, okay? And you may have profit sharing schemes in it, okay? You may have just ground leases. You know, some farmers, farmers typically can't buy as much land as they can farm with the equipment that they have. At a very primary level, and most, if you don't know, in most rural parts of the world, a local farmer will farm most of the land around him, and a lot of it he doesn't pay anything for, pays very little. Now, farm I was just up in Spain, all the excess land, the cattle guy up the road plants alfalfa, and so he'll come, he'll plant it, he'll pick it up, and he'll mow some of your you know, grass once a year for free. I used to run a plant up in Rochester. I gave 200 acres to a local farmer. I think he would give us 100 bucks an acre, and he would plow our driveway whenever it snowed. But why? He had equipment to do this, and he couldn't afford to buy another 200 acres, but he could farm it. But the real, the real issue with farmlands here is, is look at the years where you see these big booms. Was there a big housing boom here? Yep. What was happening with a lot of farmland in this country? It was either acquired or rezoned from a farm use to residential. What's happened in South Dade? What's happened in, in, in South Broward? I'm sorry, in, uh, in uh, what, West Broward, Southern Palm Beach County, right? What are people stopping in Martin County, right? Is, is people converting farmland to residential. So you see, there's, there's a lot of residential Day, Broward, Palm Beach, and all of a sudden you get Martin County, there's nothing, you gotta go to St. Lucie County up above because Martin's kinda shut that down. They'll say, no, 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 our farms are our farms. We don't want that, okay? So, but I think there was a lot of value creation here because of the changes of use, I think. I think that's why, yes, Chase? I was just driving through um, like Central Florida and I was coming back from Orlando and like the turnpike was closed and it was all through Yeehaw Junction and every single place was for sale. That was yeah, so that's, or that's, a cow grazing. That's, that's Indian River or St. Lucie County. Yeah, like everything and was for sale though. Yeah, so, so there, there's a problem with citrus in this country and I, I mean this, in this state, there's a whole canker and, and, and there's another sort of illness and then there's, there's climate change. It all has to do with, with yield and the amount of work you have to do, and it also has to do with generations, right? A lot of people that have owned these farms for a lot of years are getting old, they're dying, and what did we talk about last week? Where do young people want to live? Maybe. Yeah, young people want to work hard? I think mean, you're gonna say yes, right? But young people want to work like out on the field on a tractor all day, year no, round? Not that hard. Not that hard, right? <laughs> not that hard. And so and so a lot of that is also just people that just you know, you just get to the end of the generation, right? So anyway, so let's let's get into so listen, I put this is just like spaghetti, right? It's just a but I put all the different asset classes together. And when you do stuff like this, it's it's hard to draw trends with so much noise here, okay? But you can definitely start taking a look at things that maybe, like if you look at the dark blue one, well, that's farmland. I didn't know what it was, but you can see that it doesn't have any negative returns, and it's the one that's got the highest. You see a light blue one and the, and the you know, brown one, and that's hotels and office. Those things tend to have you know, tremendous you know, potential for downside, right? You might start looking at leading and trailing in indicators, right? So you see how... how um, um, the green here, the green here kind of went up earlier than everybody else and kind of went down a little bit later than everybody else. So maybe retail is a leading and a lagging indicator. I don't know. Maybe it is, right? Maybe people start feeling good, they start spending more, okay? So, I mean, these are just things that, you know, sort of take a look at. But for the most part, it does look like they tend to move together at the same time, okay? 
Um, Question. Yes, Sam. Um, with the current trade war happening, I read some things about how a lot of farmers are complaining about the taxes and tariffs. Will we expect to see the possibly the rates go minus, like in 2018? Like, well, so there's two issues. There's what I'm showing you is returns on farmland, people who own it, as opposed to return on farming. Okay. Okay. Um, the the problem the problem that happens is what's happening with farm products is is in particular what the big complaints are now is is the U.S. has placed tariffs on certain Chinese products, and they have placed tariffs on products that they buy from us, and they don't buy a lot from us. They buy airplanes and they buy farm products, soy, wheat, and so the soy guys are getting beat up. I, I have a friend who who works. She does risk management at a cooperative of farmers in Minnesota, and it's like they cannot get. So the prices are super depressed because their logical buyer is not buying from them, right? So she's saying it's costing them more to harvest the crop, right, than what they can sell it for. So, so the owner doesn't really get hurt. Well, well, I mean, it may ultimately make them unable to pay to the extent that it leases some land. It may impact the owner of the land he's leasing from, okay? So it may have that impact on, on the real estate return. This is, this is really a critical one, okay? And this is, how does real estate compare to the S&P 500, right? Now, this is during my observation period. So this ends around 2016. If you come to today, I don't know what the answer is, but according to what I have, privately owned real estate returned 9.1% during this observation period, and the stock market only returned 8%. The stock market had volatility of 15.5%, and real estate only had 7.4%. So what does that tell me? Wow. It tells me real estate is a revenue enhancer and a risk mitigator or reducer. So that's why it belongs in every portfolio. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because it's going to goose up your returns and bring down your volatility. Now, that's during this observation period. If you blow it out, or maybe you look at a different index, maybe you get a different result. Now, this is privately owned real estate. There's going to be a different profile for public. I'll show you that in a second. Yes, Kenny. Well, I was going to say, if that's your portfolio, did you do a combined uh, return? This is not my portfolio. This is the S&P 500. Okay. This is not me. I mean, I did this, but this is not my portfolio. This is the S&P 500 compared to the Natcrief National Index of all asset classes. Yes, Judson. Uh, just one. Also, you can see uh, with the graph, the only thing I would say is that it, I can see that the real estate is more kind of medianed out, and then you can, you know, with the uh, with S and P five hundred, you can see it's like so. So, so you can see returns too. You can see the volatility. Yeah. I know. You can see the volatility is much less, right? Uh -huh. You've got you've got much more peaks, much higher peaks and valleys with equity. Now, there's a reason for that, and that's one of your other questions I want to get to in a second. Miriam, you remember your you don't remember your questions. <laughs> Send me questions while I'm sleeping, and then you for, you're the one who forgets, but I remember. Okay? And there's also lag times here, right? So it's looking like real estate's lagging the stock market, okay? Isn't that indicative also of the characteristics of these markets where it's a higher volatility in the in the stock market, but you have a higher return probability? Yeah, but it doesn't have a higher return really. Not during this period. It's only 7.9. So you prove it's in, in logic, in logic, and my guess would be, and we're going to move forward. I, I think the author's going to tell you that if you look at a different period or a broader period, or if you look at most finance professionals, they're going to tell you in the long run the SP is going to have a higher return. Okay? But I can only look at the period that I've looked at, that I've got data for. That's what that's what I can talk to. So based okay? on these uh, well, uh, yeah. uh these yeah. returns is proving the theory wrong though. Well, there, there is no theory that says anything, you know, theory, what, what all, I'm, all, I'm, all I'm telling you out there, all I'm telling you out there in this is, is, is there's a case to be made for real estate as an investment vehicle. That's all I'm saying. It, it is a revenue enhancer and a risk mitigator. That's the only thing that I, now, we can look at a tighter period here and it might show a different story. We might look at a broader period and look at, uh, what, what definitely, what definitely impacts real estate in this time frame is that real estate has become an asset class that's become investable during this time frame and it's pushed valuations.
Okay, if you look at a much broader period, real estate was not really in vogue and would have you know, some sort of lower return profile. And it may have a lower return profile going forward as well. Okay, so um, the problem with looking at and creating benchmarks, if you look at too long a period behind you, have you ever heard of the term momentum investing? Mm -hmm. What's momentum investing? You just trade as it's going up instead of... Yeah, so the pound. stock's going up, you pound on it, right? Because yeah. it because it's hot, right? It's like hot money. You pound on it, right? Um, so the, the problem when you look at very short trends is that you don't really have a lot of history behind you, but you might have a more indicative result of what may happen, right? Yeah, but that also goes into effect. In but, but, that's why, but that's why we're going to talk about beta next week. And so when you look at beta, when you look at volatility, um, you know, there's an argument to be made for looking at shorter periods, which may be more indicative of what's going to happen in the recent future, rather than looking at very long trends. I, I happen to like long trends because I like to look at long periods of time and returns over long periods of time. Okay? Uh, this is something I want to show you. A couple of things I'm going to show you that are tools that you can take home with you for your own analyses. I know you want to do this stuff all the time. This is something called mean variance analysis. And ultimately it talks to something called the co uh, coefficient of variation. Okay? And it basically looks at, it looks at risk and return, right, as a relationship to one another. And it basically says how many units, right, of risk am I taking for every unit of return? Okay, so the formula is actually deviation over mean. Okay, and so when you, and this is, you know, kind of like IRR lets you look at a lot of different projects and this one has a higher return than this one. The coefficient of variation kind of tells you, you know, what is, what is riskier for the return that you're getting? Okay, and so, when you kind of look at this, you look at things like farmland and retail give you a lot more bang for less risk than things like hotel and office. And we saw that individually, okay? Um, people, in equities, people talk a lot more about sharp ratio. I'm not going to get into the sharp ratio, but it's, a, it's another way of looking at risk-adjusted return, okay? It's looking at, at return in relation for the risk in the case of Sharp, that you're taking the excess return you're getting over a benchmark, okay? Now, uh, the other tool that you could use with this is, is you can plot this on a chart, right? So you could use the same thing, right? Return and risk, and, and where do you want to go? You want to go northwest, right? You want higher return and lower risk, right? So this very easily takes a look at this, and you can see how farmland is like the most northwest of these. Yes, Brian? No disrespect, but when is our break? I don't know. So, if you need to go, you can go, Brian. Um, so the question becomes, um, public equity returns by asset class. We looked at private equity, right? So then the question now becomes, how does public equity differ from private equity? Hmm. Is there a difference? to public returns, you know, trump private ones, right? So, so the one advantage that public equity has is it has liquidity. If you own a share in a REIT, re, what can you do? Get on your Schwab account and sell it, right? Can you do that if you have a, a, a limited partnership interest in a, in a private equity? You can't. You can't redeem it. You're stuck with it until they sell the asset, right? So does that come with a cost? And does that cost a lower return? Or is it more volatility? That's interesting. It's one way to look at it, right? So, um, so you know, this is the same info from Nacrief and then Nayri. Uh, so, this is the textbook. This is San Miguel. San Miguel doesn't have the resources that the author has. He's not as intelligent as the author, okay? So, San Miguel can only take a look at, during the same time frame, he can only take a look at five asset classes, okay? The author looks at all REIT classes. He looks at equity REITs and mortgage REITs. I only looked at office, industrial, retail, apartments, and hotel. And I didn't 
value weighted, weigh them. Okay, so they're equally weighted. So I didn't have, what does that mean? It means that maybe this is a much bigger number than this, but when I weighted them, each one is worth 20%. Okay, and I'm talking about market value, right? So when you take a look at the S&P 500, it is a value weighted index. That means that if Apple is a billion dollars, or, or trillion dollars of market cap, it has that over the total valuation of the stock market as a weight. It's not one out of 500. Make sense? Okay, so when I look at this, and I, I just put average, indicative, it's not mathematically accurate, but when with the limited resources that I have by asset class, when I average them, I look at Nate Creep was a 9.3 and 8.4 return, okay? May Reef was actually higher, but look how much more volatility it has, 23% of standard deviation. Now, the author has uh, different numbers than I have, okay? He has 12% versus my 10, okay? I'll buy his, I'll take his numbers, that's why I put it. And he's got slightly lower volatility than I have, but again, he's looking at a, at a, at a value-weighted scenario, and he's looking at all the REITs. I only looked at these five asset classes, okay? But, so, he's coming up with the same general conclusions, okay? The mean return is higher, okay, for public equities, but the, but the, uh, the standard deviation, the volatility, the risk is higher as well. So, the additional cost for that liquidity premium doesn't come in the way of a lower return, it comes in more volatility, okay? So, that, that's what you pay for. You're paying for more risk. You're actually getting a higher return, okay, but you're getting more risk. Now, we'll talk about correlation next week, but what the, the author is saying is, is that real estate is really not correlated with debt instruments, and when we talk about correlation, what's correlation? That it moves in the same direction. Or opposite, so well, we, we could talk about, we typically talk about correlation in a minus one to a one setting, right? Things that are correlated one to one are perfectly right and completely correlated so when one goes up it goes up right if they're perfectly inversely correlated it means when one goes up the other one goes down um, oil stocks and airline stocks what's the single biggest cost in airlines oil. fuel right fuel goes up what happens to air, airplane valve down right okay so so those would be stocks that should theoretically be inversely correlated Things that have a correlation near zero mean that they're independent. It means there's no relationship, okay? And a lot of times when people are trying to build portfolios, they're looking for this. They're looking for, they're looking for low correlation. They want assets that are not correlated to one another so that, so that there isn't, you know, the piling on effect or the dilution of a return, okay? So, uh, but I, that's, that's for a statistics class. And so I beta. Beta, beta is, beta is, I'm going to talk about beta next week. Beta is not correlation, but it does use covariance and variance. And I'll talk about that next week, okay? I've already got that repaired, okay? So, this is the author, uh, the way he puts nay creef to nay read, and you can see that this is smoother. Nay creef is smoother, nay read is choppier, okay? And, um, this is, you know, my version. I added on the S&P in green, okay? You can definitely see the same thing, right? You can definitely see that, that, that private equity real estate is, is less choppy. You can see something that's interesting. From, from this time frame to here, especially from here to here, public equity real estate behaves almost like the S&P, okay? And what's happened is, is, in 1994, REIT stocks started forming part of the S&P index. So what happens is public equity real estate now behaves a lot more like the stock market than it does like real estate, okay? So its returns are gonna look a lot more like, um, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like uh, the S&P, okay? But the returns uh, are higher. Sorry? The returns are yeah, higher. Yeah, well, but, but listen, when you say returns are higher, yeah, during this time frame as well. I, the, and, and that's, and 
REITs became REITs and real estate in general became really hot, okay? It became really hot. Uh, this is just by asset class, so there's no, um, um, you know, if you want to look at it, I'll show it to you. I'll send, I'll send you this slide presentation, but that's, so that's it. I, I mean, I can just tell you is, as you can see that public and privately owned real estate do seem to, to be, you know, fair investments in comparison to equities, public equities. And, and in the private realm, they tend to have less volatility. Now, I need to answer one question. We'll take a quiz and then we'll take a break. Miriam asked me a question related to why was Naycreef less volatile than Nay Reed? Yeah, because it's the appraisal. Well, but did I say that or did you say that? I said that. Because you, you said there are four reasons why that is, and I said, well, I never said that. No, you said that, yes. but you didn't know what the fourth one was. Okay, so, so here's the problem. Here's the problem with private data. So public data is very simple. You look at the newspaper every day and you see what the trading price for an equity is. It's very simple to calculate fair market value. How do you calculate fair market value when you have real estate that's privately owned? Perfect. Appraisals. How often do you, do you appraisals? Okay, so most private equity firms will do a formal appraisal every two years and we'll do an in-house appraisal in between. Now, I'm not saying people are stacking the cards, but when you are not marking the market every day, you definitely don't have the same choppiness. Sometimes market react very badly and it, they come back very quickly, right? But if you gotta do your period here where the only valuation you did was internal. And, and what happens in rapidly moving markets? What's the problem with appraisals? What appraisals? Appraisals use. What do we use for appraisals in real estate? Three different. Who's an appraiser in here? Okay. Well, what's the first one people use? Comps. Comps. Comparable sales. What's the next way that they they do? So they'll look at discounted cash flows. What's the third thing they look at? Replacement cost. And cost of the to redevelop, right? Right, to put it back up. So it's a replacement cost, right? So so a, a proper appraisal looks at these three things. I, so so appraisers use use comparables, they use a discounted cash flow, and they look at look at replacement costs. And then they will make it professional. I know that MAI, the Master Appraisal Institute, does not stand for made as instructed. Okay, you, you don't tell them what the value is and they figure it out. But comparables are probably the most indicative one of all. I could tell you for years in this country, most assets are purchased below replacement cost. That's, from a development perspective, it's very difficult to develop with the land values that we have in, in places like South Florida. So comps are very valuable. But if all of a sudden you've got a dislocation in a market like this, I've got a comparable slide. I, I could pull it up, but it's not relevant. No, it's, not relevant. It's, it's not really important not to show it. But what happens in a market like this is there's, there's no transactions. Also, transaction volume in 2007, commercial real estate transactions went from $700 billion in a year to less than $40 billion the next year. Stand still. If you don't have comps, how do you value it? I understand that, but now, you, now, you're, now you're assuming a lot of stuff, okay? So what I'm saying is, is, is the, the appraisals are definitely impacted, okay? And so there's a smoothing. And I'm not saying it's artificial, it's just the way it is. There is a smoothing of values that does, does, does give that, the, the privately owned real estate, uh, you know, less volatility, okay? Uh, the other thing is when you've got rapidly moving markets, all of a sudden you see this rebound, boom, what happens to values? Go way up. But, but the appraisers are looking at what happened three months ago or two months ago and the values are totally different. So in rapidly moving markets, historical comps are not a great indicator or definitely need to be adjust, adjusted with a tremendous amount of, of, of personal judgment, okay? So, um, Okay, 
Did that answer your question? What other question did you have? Are all your other questions are? She asked a question. Do all the... No, I'll, I'll answer that one later. Okay, you guys want to take the quiz now? No. Yes. After the break. Yeah. Okay, take a break. The quiz will start at 3.05. 3.05, you'll have 10 minutes to do the quiz. At 3.15, we start the balance of the class. You need a break? It's too much, huh? You need a break. No, no, I'll fall. I'll need a break when I get home. I'll have a beer. I'll have a beer. And I just collapse. I collapse after classes, you know. Thanks. Yeah, you're like, you're out of breath. You just go. Actually, I don't have a spurs. No. Yeah. So the quiz can be on everything you talked about, right? Yeah, I think so. And what yeah, and what was and was and was it's in the reading, almost all of it. Most of it. And the reading? And the reading, but I talked about the reading. I think everything <laughs> you should have ninety-nine percent of of it. You should know it. You should know hundred percent. Shoot. I thought Jose Bob was like, mm, I don't know about that. Naisha, you nervous? Yes. Why? You have like a 90 something in this class. What are you nervous about? Um, you want 100. You well, no, you don't feel like you're learning. No, I'm learning, but I feel like I'm putting a lot of effort in into that. learning. So, like, I feel like I should. Maybe I'm more so upset about the other class. The other one is so I looked at the quiz, and so and, and I, I looked at the quiz this morning, and I would tell you I could probably do all those, but I would probably get them all wrong if I sat down and did the test. Yeah, because the, and I, yeah, the, the problem, the problem. Well, I don't know if you saw in my videos, like I make mistakes all the time. In fact, one of the questions I'm going to go over now, Miriam. One of the questions is there is a mistake in one of the videos, and she, nobody else picked it up. She did. And um, it's 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 you know, and I say that I want to you you know you we do make mistakes, mm -hmm. and and so the problem is in, when you're not used to being in a classroom setting, and all of a sudden you get a quiz like the one you had, or even the one I want to give you. The one I want to give you is not mathematical, but it's still trying to remember the things that we just right. talked about and you read. It takes a while to get. It, it, look, it's a stupid story, but. 15 years ago, a friend of mine asked me to teach Sunday school for him one day. So, okay, hold on. So, we had this class, there's like seven or eight students, and two of them are football players that I'm coaching at the time. This is when I used to coach little kids. So, you know, we finished, we finished the, the class, and I said, okay, now we get a quiz. Oh, you, God doesn't give quizzes, you know, these are like 13 year old kids. God, we're, you're doing a quiz. Okay, now the, the two kids, the two boys I had in there, they were dumb shit, okay? I mean, they were they were not bright kids. So they were like a 10, little quiz like this. You know the only two kids that got it right? All right? The football players. Do you know why? Because they were used to being on the field with me, listening to how I spoke. And the other, the other girls, you know, they took pretty notes. Well, they really weren't taking notes because they didn't think they were going to have a quiz. But... So it's, it's, it's also a process of, of, of learning to listen and then quickly react. You're like, hey, you're not convincing me. You're going to do fine. I can already see you're going to do fine in the program, even if you feel at times like it's too much. Trust me, I've been teaching here a long time. I can see, I can see who will flourish and who will fail. <laughs> He's going to have to give you a good grade. The only people who fail the classes, <laughs> I can tell you, the only people who fail the classes are the people who don't try. I think with all instructors, we will all find a way if you put effort. If you don't put effort, nobody's going to work out of their way. To, and at the end of the day, what matters in a graduate program is that you learn. No one's going to say, oh, uh, what was your GPA in a graduate program? What matters is that you said, look, yeah, I can build models. 
Yeah, I know about time value of money. Yeah, I know how to amortize debt. You know, that, I think those things. Are, yeah, I know about construction. Yeah, I know about I know about zoning and planning. Yeah, I know about business law. I know about title. Those are things that. You, Miriam, you still have two more questions you need to ask me. Today. Just today? No, I'm just kidding. That's fine. Today you're, That's you're blank. Okay. You have two more questions. I think I remember that. To like, to like really digest? No, no, but they're, they're, good, they're good questions. They're good questions. questions. They're good questions. They're good questions. They're good questions. They're good questions. And as soon as you hit the last number, it's like you have a question for me. You don't have time to digest it. You look ready. You look like you're ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> Wait now, we're gonna have to build a fucking new new model. Yeah. Okay. You you have ten minutes to solve the housing crisis. <laughs> When's the housing bubble? Yeah, yeah. Finish? But I want to make sure I get my forty minutes of current events. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. It's ridiculous. It's fucking ridiculous. Positive. No. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I just thought about that. Oh, man, the chat. I feel like I'm a Russian and they're like a coffee. Yeah, it's conversational. Yeah, it's like, oh, and then you're like, and then, and then like, in a napkin, like, quiz. All right. That was like remarkably accurate. Okay, it's 305. Let's take the quiz. It's eight questions. Uh, put your name on the top. Let me make sure that I don't get the answers out. We, we, I think we've gone through all these things. These are from the, from the, I think almost all of these are from the book and from, I like, went over what the book had, so. What do you mean open book? Come on, man. Okay, we started open book. I mean, I could just give you a hundred. That's a great idea. Is it really? Yes. But then how would I know that you really liked, <laughs> like you really learned from the model? That's not a good, that's not a good. Uh... Yeah, we were almost there, Alec. You had to say that. Connor, do you talk? <laughs> okay, I hadn't heard you say anything in two classes, man. I just want to make sure. I, is it something I said? Miriam, was it something I said? <laughs> Kenny? Alejandro, Kenny's from the Bronx. Oh, yeah. No, Kenny over yeah, there. Yeah, Kenny. What's the form? Very easy test. Put your name on the top.
can spell some of this stuff. <laughs> It was like the Lord students said, if you look at your neighbor's answers, they're not necessarily right. We've got about five minutes to finish, please. Three minutes. Should be wrapping up. We have two minutes, two minutes. minute and a half. Make sure your name's on it.
gonna start. There's no more breaks, guys. We're gonna pull through. Yeah. But, I mean, you can take a break if you need to. And the last 10 minutes will Thank you, Brian. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Oh, do we have any? Oh, you're I better get a hundred. I was just looking at it. I have no problem with two from Okay, so. Okay, so. So, so, so. Um, before I go to the spreadsheet, okay? So I want to spend, I, I want to spend a little bit more time than I did the other day working on spreadsheets. Um, the first question that I have is, do we have any questions on the first four videos from last week on Excel? Just Excel in general, formatting? Yes, ma'am. So, Yeah, so I mean, so so what I would say that the, the learning takeaway from last week was that you would that you would have wound up doing something like hold on, let me put my glasses on. So so that what you would have learned in the video, what you would have done in class, and what you would have done after the, the class would be to create a very simple model. Now, do you have to format it the way I format it? No, not necessarily. I mean, you humor your instructor if you do something similar, okay? But, but, but there are flow things that I think are important. So, what I would say is, if I, if I, uh, so if I were to finish last week and I could have done something like this, I don't know if you can see it from over there, I feel good. You say, well, that's pretty simple. Okay, I mean, I said it, we, we're gonna start slow. If you could start and do a simple five-year projection where you segregate income, expenses, to arrive at NOI, that's good because now we're building from here. And you can see today we're gonna to build more years and I wanna start bringing in some time value money concepts to it. So. If you got that, you're on the right path. Is that it? No? Yes? I mean, yeah, but I, I just feel more. like we haven't worked a lot on building in Excel. Okay, well that's, right, but that's that's why I, I sent the videos in advance. Well, yeah, but in your videos, you already have everything done. I, I built this from scratch in the video. Go to video number four, there was nothing yeah, you here. Sent them on one. No, no, no. That Wednesday is this. That's this week. But I'm going to last week first. And this is what I'm, I'm talking about. The first week? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. I did the first one. Okay. This is the first one. I'm still on last week right now. Okay. So if you got through this last week. Right. Uh, well, I'm coming, Ramon. I'm coming. If you got through this last week, you're on a good path. Now, we're going to work on this week. And hopefully this week i got a little bit more time to go through some of the concepts. Yes. Some of the stuff was built, but I'm going to build some now for you from scratch. So you can see how to do it. One second. Yes, Ramon. I don't know if it's my Excel, but I was trying to follow you on the video before that. Before that video. You see you have um, the parentheses, and you was able to drag it over and all kinds of parentheses. But when I did, when I did the parentheses, it actually added it instead of subtracting. I got. I got to look. I got to see what happened on your spreadsheet. It's the only way that I can see it. Okay. Guys, listen, because the questions might be relevant to everybody. Yes. When you use a minus sign at the beginning, do you follow them with the parentheses in order to get the? Uh, I mean, the uh, colon. The, it, no, the col no. So, so the minus sign is if you want. So, when, when you're dealing with time value of money issues, you either got to make the flow. Or the present value negative, otherwise you get a negative value. So I put negative at the beginning just so that I get a positive value. But you don't have to do that. Does, does that answer the question? 
kind of. Well, yeah, because I know I was following the way you was doing Right. And then um, what, and how it turned out with mine is when I had the uh, surrounding in the attic. And then when I took it off, and it just had that for equal. I, I, I just, I'll stay after class. Just show me. All right. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Chase. So when you were saying that the money sign should only be at the top and the bottom, so I would just drag... Currency, the currency sign. Yes, correct. So I would just grab the entire boxes and put them all into financial format. So like, how do you then, once you put them all into financial format so that you get, you know, the parentheses around negative numbers and such, how do you then remove the number sign on the interior cells so, without so, removing the So I the think financial. what you're trying to... Is this big enough or do I need to make it bigger? Bigger. So what you're telling me is, bigger. is even bigger? So you're telling me like, so for example. Yeah, if you highlighted everything. So if I highlight out all of this and did what to it? And then just went up and clicked that right there. Well, yeah. Hold on, that. Right, so now how, if How do you just, get rid of this stuff? Correct. Okay, just come over here and go to here, comma. Just reformat the cells. That's way. it. Cool, thank you. You got it? Yep. Kenny, you had a question. Well, no, I was going to ask for Ramon, because he said he, he just puts the minus sign. Every I, time you put a sign on it, it activates the sum function. So if you don't, if you leave it, if you go equals whatever number, it starts adding. If you put minus, it starts adding without the or equal. Or it starts subtracting. Yeah. Well, it starts point, an operation. Yeah. Let me, let me, I'll take a look at it, and we'll see. Okay? Other questions on basic Excel? Yes. Or just that all, all models in the class will lead into each other so far numbers are slightly different. Right? Yeah, I, I would encourage so I would encourage you to go back. So we're gonna do some things today. I would encourage you to the extent that you maybe don't do that well today, to you know, take the time afterwards and send it to me. And I'll and there are some of you who missed a deadline the other day and sent me your spreadsheets and I took the time to look at them. Right? Did I take the time to look at it? Okay, so I, 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 if, if you don't think you got it, work it again and send it to me and I'll tell you, yeah, look, I, you know, I, I see that, I don't see that. Okay? Now, that's, that's Excel last week. That's the basic Excel. Okay? That's this. I, did, I said two more videos this week. One is, is more Excel driven. We're going to do some of that right now. But before I do that, there was one that had to do with financial ratios and relationships. Did, did you guys look at that? I said there were a lot of views on that. Are there any questions? I'm going to blow through that, but are there any specific questions on those? My, my, my goal... My goal is to try to get the videos out Monday or Tuesday. Now, here's the problem. Monday, I have jury duty. So I've already got, like, the material ready to tape, but if I get called, I don't know when I'll tape it. And on Tuesday, I know you're not sensitive to it, but I forget what it was now, but I, I had some sort of personal problem that took me out of the house. I, don't, I, I wish I knew what it was right now. I don't remember what it was. But I, and, and to be candid, I recorded the second video Tuesday night, and I didn't like it, and I re-recorded it Wednesday. Because I didn't want it going out the way it was, so, so I went to sleep on it. To your point, Naisha, we make mistakes, we build video, I mean, we build spreadsheets, but sometimes they're not good enough, and you gotta put them, put them down and start all over again. And so it's important to work, Step away, work, step away. So my goal is to try to get ahead. I, I would have ideally had all the videos for the class done, but I also needed to see where the class was, right? Um, and, and I think I'm, I'm happy that we're going lockstep, I think, one week at a time. So Tuesday, Wednesday, that's when I'm gonna try to get them out, okay? Okay. So, Miriam, you had a question on the definitions and things like that, or no? Do you want me to pop that up real quick? I'm gonna, I'll, I'll pop them up, and, and then. Sorry? For the financial ratio? Yes, ma'am. 
You get the number, but you don't know what to do with it. Yes. Uh, Okay, so uh, not, not, not all the ratios that, I, that I've that gone over might be relevant to you today or even tomorrow, but maybe sometime in your existence. No, it's not that. I get the number, but then you give us the definition. And to me it's too abstract, like sometimes I really need an example. Okay. All right, well, let, let, me, let me try to I'll put this in, into context, okay? <laughs> So, so financial ratios are relationships that exist, and what we do in, in the financial world is we try to draw relationships that exist between, guys, income statement and balance sheet items that hopefully give us some insight into what's happening in a particular business or operation or asset, okay? So, so as, a, as a backdrop, the reason that these relationships exist is we're trying to understand, and I talked about like four types of ratio analyses that we do. I talked about profitability. So we're trying to see how much money a business makes. When we're looking at, at leverage ratios, we're trying to see on the capital stack whose who's money's at risk. And I'll throw into that coverage, right? So how safe is the debt? How repayable is it? Uh, when we talk about liquidity, and I didn't go into those, when we look at liquidity ratios, we're looking at companies' ability to meet their obligations, okay? When we look at turnover ratios, when we look at asset turnover, day sales and receivables, when we look at inventory turnover, we're looking at efficiency. Management's efficiency with the assets that they've been entrusted with, okay? And when we look at some of these other ratios like dividend yield or payout ratio, we're trying to draw conclusions that may or may not be helpful for us in understanding a particular scenario. Okay, so, so not all of the ratios are going to mean something to you or that you're going to find that you, you have a need for today. But somewhere down the line, you might have a need for them. So that's, so I, I may be talking about some of these things you're saying, well, that sounds very, you know, this guy's talking about I didn't have one. There's one called gross rent multiplier. It's one that's used in a multifamily industry. So people talk about the relationship of gross rents to purchase price. You, you might go like, what's he talking about? I don't care about that. I don't, know, I don't know what it means. But maybe you're having lunch with somebody one day and they go, yeah, that's like a, you know, a 3x, you know? And you're going to go, wow, now, now I understand. So, so if you tell me what specific ratio you've got a, a concern with, maybe I can put it more into context. When I give you a dollar to invest, how much you're able to make a money with it? Mm -hmm. So, so you're talking about like profitability ratios, yes. like so, so, so when we talk about profitability ratios, I gave you three, three big ones there. I talked about gross margin, I talked about net profit margin, and I talked about return on investment. Mm -hmm. Okay. When I talk about net margin, net profit margin. That's ultimately the most important one of all the profitability ratios because it says sales, right? And it says net income, right? So after you subtracted all of your cost of goods sold, you're selling general and administrative expenses, all your interest and everything else, how much from the $100 that you collected, how much were left? So this is a relationship of net income over sales, right? So this tells me, how efficient are you in running the business? Maybe you can generate, maybe you're like Amazon. You can generate, you know, $8 trillion worth of sales, but you made pennies, right? Maybe you're a supermarket, right? And you sell hundreds of millions of dollars and you make pennies. So how efficient are you at operating the business, okay? Or, or, or. How were you compared to how you were last year? How does this compare to what you modeled? And how does it compare to everybody else that's in the same business as you are? That's the relevance of it. Well, this is net income. Now, now, 
gross, gross profit margin is sales less cost of sales, right? So gross margin divided by sales. And this talks, this is very important, and a lot, of, a lot of analysts take a look at this number because it tells you how much profit there is in the sale of a, bit, of a particular product or good, okay? It, it ignores selling and G&A expenses, or R&D. So, you know, I sold the phone. How much did the phone cost me? Okay? So, I've got a 65% margin on my phones. Now I know I got a lot of money to play with to cover all these other expenses. Or, I sold it for 100, it cost me 95. I can't provide all the other support that I need. Now, let me close the loop. When we talk about ROI, it ultimately is taking a look at the profit that I made, what kind of return does that give me versus the equity that I invested? Like it, like it, when you invest what you pull back in terms of profit? Well, but it's not that simple, Miriam. I mean, uh, so we have measures of profitability, but then that's why there's other ratios. So not all profits are distributed, yes. right? So that's why we have things like earnings per share, which I showed you, and dividends per share, which talk to the payout or retention ratio, so that you can get every measure along the way. How much profit did I make? How much does the company keep? How much do they pay to their shareholders? Okay? Guys, it's really difficult looking at tops of heads, man. It's really difficult. Um, um, and how much comes to me? So that I can ultimately get to your question, which is, I gave you so much, how much are you giving me back? That would be like the dividends. What are you giving me back? It, it, it could be dividend in the context of a traditional business. In the context of a real estate business, you might be looking at cash on cash return. And that's why I gave you traditional businesses, and then I, I gave you the parallel in the real estate realm. And we'll keep working, we'll keep building on these. This is the first time that you're exposed to some of these. When you've been in a program, things like cash on cash return, you should have covered in other classes. Okay, all right. Well, we'll keep working on it, okay? Any, so, I mean, I just kind of talked about profitability ratios. Uh, let me see if there's any one in particular. ROI, I mean, I spent the whole thing on the DuPont analysis. There's a really interesting, I mean, if you like this stuff, I happen to like, you know, at the end of the day, on a personal level, on a personal level, when I make investments, when I look at stocks, when I figure out if something's a good investment or not, I use these tools. So I look at things like, I look at things like leverage, right? So, so I look at levered and unlevered scenarios. I look at debt to equity ratios. I look at profitability. Okay? I look at return on equity. If I go a little bit higher, I look at book value. I look at earnings per share. I look at price earnings ratios. Those are all things that are very helpful in investing. But when you look at real estate and you don't look at those things, cap rate is important. Present value is important. IRR is important, okay? Cash on cash return is important. Um, NOI is important. They're all, it's, it's what helps you make, they're the inputs to give you the ability to make buy-sell decisions, which is why we're in this class, which is why we're in this program, I think. So, so this may look like a bunch of mumbo jumbo, but but these two numbers, especially ROE, net income over equity, talks to your profitability. And if you want the equivalent in real estate, I'd say the closest you get is cash on cash return. Different concepts, okay? We, have, we, we talk about, typically talk about tax frictionless environments in real estate, so tax components aren't there, okay? But it's the yield on your investment. Okay, so, um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer. I mean, I went through every one of these. Um, I'd rather spend time on Excel if that's, you know. Are there any questions? No. Okay. All right, well, then I'm going to move to Excel. Um, here's what I want to do. I'm going to build, I'm going to build a little more intricate model, okay? I'm going to build a little bit more intricate model, and I'm going to start adding some additional bells and whistles. One of the things that we talked about was uh, the measures that you use to figure out whether an investment or you have a buy-sell decision in real estate. The two most critical components that I would look at with my years in the industry is cap rate, and IRR. I don't want to get to IRR yet. I didn't even talk about IRR. One, you're going over it in another class, those of you that are doing the finance class now. Okay? The other thing is I want to build to there because I started with future value for a reason, to work the present value for a reason, to work the net present value for a reason. And then and then I explained at least I explained IRR as as the discount rate where net present value is zero. Okay, so it's essentially the discount rate at where your at where your net present value is zero. But it's a progression of thinking. But it ultimately talks to do I buy, do I sell, or what price can I pay depending on the particular return profile that I'm looking for. Right? So I've got to solve for IRR. I ultimately have to see what kind of return that project gives me. And why do I look at cap rate today? Because it's the only relative valuation measure that I have compared to other assets in the marketplace. Every real estate asset is unique. No one building is like another one. I could have identically built buildings in the same project development, and they're going to have different cash profiles. Why? They've got different tenants. Those tenants have different credit profiles. They take different space. They pay different rents. And hence, they produce different cash flow. So while they physically may look like they're the same, and they may be geographically located next to one another, each one has its own DNA. Okay? And the only way that I can compare those, the relative valuation, just like with stocks, we use price earnings as a comparison of how expensive or how cheap this stock is compared to this one. Cap rates tell me this building is more expensive or less expensive than this one. Or it's in the same ballpark as all other similar assets. So when you underwrite something, the two critical measures that I would suggest to any real estate investor, cap rate, that tells me the relative valuation today, IRR, tells me my, what my project return is going to be. Now, there's a bunch of stuff we've got to build on to get to uh, you know, that IRR. So we're going to go one step at a time. We'll roll into IRR next week, but I want to talk about some basic concepts first. Does that make sense? Yes, Cole. Um, so in your email, you did mention that we forgot to uh, multiply by 12, and I just yeah. wanted to see in terms of how you did that for the formula. Yeah, so good question. Yeah, so I mean, in this particular case, all I did was multiply by 12. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, then and I multiplied by 12 in the cell below it. Okay? Pretty simple? Okay. Now, I, I, I want to I wanna, I wanna go back for a second, and I, I want to, I'm not going to repeat the video. Because, I, I mean, listen, for, for me, anytime I look at a finance book, you look at concepts of present value and future value, and you say, okay, I mean, these people are talking like, these theoretical things. What does that have to do with real estate? What does that have to do with this class? Well, there's a progression. And, and you can skip the video, and I will just tell you, when we talk about future value, $100 today, given a particular interest rate or discount rate, is going to be what tomorrow? Right? Pretty simple. But i got to start here. I start there. Present value is, and what's the formula for future value? 
1 over 1 over 1 plus r. 1 over 1 is 1. <laughs> so what, it, what, what it's, it's the dollars that I got today. It's the sum, the deposit that I got today, multiplied by 1 plus r to the n, right? So 1 plus the interest rate or the discount rate to the number of periods that it's out there, right? So that's the formula for present value. We need to know that. It's pretty simple. We need to know that. So once we know what future value is, right, we can talk about present value. And present value is a similar concept, but it says $100 here are worth what today? So same concept, but working backwards. What's the formula for present value? It's future value divided by 1 plus r to the n. Right? Pretty simple, right? Now, so the video just sort of explains this, and it gives you mathematical examples. It talks about this. It gives you mathematical examples. And then it introduces the concept of an annuity. I've got a good question, and I'll show you afterwards, because there is, there is a slight, I don't want to, there's a complication there. I'll show you afterwards, OK? Um, you asked a question if ratios, I just remembered, you asked a question if ratios should always be percentages. Some of them are, some of them are not. Price earnings are, not, are, not, are multiples, they're X, okay? Most of them are percentages, but not all of them, okay? So, so this is present value, this is future, I'm sorry, this is future value, this is present value. What's an annuity? It's a sequence of payments, right? So, so if we take a look at an annuity in the context of future values, right? You know, we could say, I got 100 today, I'm going to put 100 tomorrow, I'm going to put 100 the day after, I'm going to put 100 the day after that. What's that going to grow to? Okay? A present value in the context of an annuity is a little bit different, right? And it says, if I want 100 here, and I want 100 here, and I want 100 here, and I want 100 here, so this is year one, year two, year three, year four, how much do I have to put in today so that at the discount rate, right, I get 100 here? And this is what real estate is. This is what a real estate model is. If I want the cash flow that I'm modeling in year four, and in year five, or sorry, year three, and in year two, and in year one, and my cost of capital is 6%, how much do I pay for that building? How much do I give that bank? Right? And that's, that's all a real estate model is. And that's why we need to understand what future value is, and what present value is, and what an annuity, a present value annuity is. Because at the end of the day, any model that we build in real estate, any financial model that we build in real estate, that we solve for net present value, or what we're going to call IRR, okay? Anytime we solve for that, what we're talking about is a present value annuity. A present value of an annuity. Okay? And the purchase price up front happens to be what we're paying up front in exchange for this annuity that's going to yield, bless you, the return at which we're discounting. Does that make sense? So, wait a second. So, you're saying you have to think of a real estate investment as an annuity? Yeah, that's what it is. You're, you're paying a certain amount right. in exchange for all these, all these inflows later on. That's all it is. Yeah. It's a present value annuity. And how you solve for the purchase price is by saying, what kind of return am I looking for? Given the cash flows that I'm modeling, what return profile do I want to see? Or do I need to see? And next week we'll talk a little bit about weighted average cost of capital because we need to understand what that number is and how we can construct it or what's acceptable.